All right, this is the Budget and Finance Committee meeting. Uh, Council Member Dominguez is excused, and we have three separate minutes that need approval tonight. There's Budget and Finance Committee meeting May 5th, 2021, Budget and Finance Committee meeting May 6th, 2021, and Budget and Finance Committee meeting May 7th, 2021. And if there are any comments, corrections about any of those, could hear that now. That would be fantastic. Um, I'll make a motion. Do you want to, can I take all three of them together? Yes, if there are no corrections, we can take them all together. All right, I'll make a motion to approve the minutes for May, or the Budget and Finance Committee meeting for May 5th, 6th, and 7th, 2021. I'll second that. Thank you, and can we all say aye? Is that an option? <laughs> all right, all in favor? Aye. Okay. Oh, I, I didn't say I, I. All right, we've approved all of the minutes, so we are adjourned. Thank you. 6.32, welcome to the Murray City Council meeting. Uh, I'll call the meeting to order, and I've asked Cat Martinez to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Kat. Uh, let's see, we have approval of the minutes for council meeting for May 18th. Do I have any corrections or deletions? Nope, I will move that, or will you accept a motion? I will accept a motion. If you will accept a motion, I will move of approval of the council meeting minutes from May 18th, 2021. I'll second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Brooke? Ms. Turner? Aye. Mr. House? Aye. Ms. Martinez? Aye. Mr. Cox? Aye. And I, I neglected to excuse Rosalba Dominguez from uh, the council meeting. She's excused tonight. Next is special recognition, Murray City Council Employee of the Month, Jake Sutton, Police Officer Brett Hales, and Craig Burnett. Thanks, Dale. Craig and Jake, are you there? Here. Here. Awesome. Do we get to see him or no? There we go. We want to see that <laughs> smiley face. All right. Um, this is a program that we started uh, several years ago uh, for Employee of the Month and uh, for council, from the council, and uh, Jake Sutton was uh, selected from the police department, and uh, Jake's been with the force for five years, uh, really quite a, a cool um, story on Jake, and I won't steal uh, Craig's thunder, so I'll let Craig uh, present that, but uh, Jake, will we have that $50 gift card for you, and and a um, certificate showing that, and also um, we'll put your name back on the uh, on a plaque that hangs back on the council uh, in the council council chambers. And as a council, we just want to let you know how much we appreciate you for your service uh, to our city and for the citizens. And uh, and again, I'd say more, but I'm going to let Craig uh, go ahead and and explain. Uh, uh, share with us this the story of Jake. But Jake, thanks so much. And again, as a council, we really, really appreciate your service and for your uh, employment here at Murray City. Thank you so much. Okay, my turn. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you. Uh, you know, it's always uh, hard to pick somebody for uh, officer of the month, but it's not because it's hard to pick someone. It's hard to, to narrow it down there's so many people doing so much good uh, every day and uh, you know this this one was uh, was a fairly easy one for us this month and uh, uh, glad to have the opportunity to uh, recognize Jake Jake's like I said has been with us for about a little over five years uh, Jake also served our country in the Marine Corps correct yes sir uh, prior to his service here so you know he's he has a, a history of, uh, of service and uh, you know we're proud of of him and what he's done. Uh, he's uh, currently uh, on our uh, 
one of our motor officers, uh, which is kind of a hard job at times because their job is to go out and make friends, <laughs> uh, enforce the enforce the, the traffic laws and handle all the issues that go on uh, with that, whether it be uh, doing school zone enforcement during the school year. They do a great job with that. And just about anything else we ask them to do, uh, including getting all hot and riding their bikes on 4th of July or the 3rd of July for us this year. So we're uh, that and uh, currently also serves on our SWAT team. So there's so much that he does and that, uh, that could be recognized and we could talk about, but uh, the one thing that, uh, that jumped out this month that uh, we felt he needed to be recognized for uh, is uh, as a, one of our motor officers, Jake has become uh, our an instructor. And so he can train and uh, certify and, uh, and teach our officers on, uh, on the motorcycle. And, uh, so he was out uh, finishing up his uh, instructor school uh, here about, uh, about a month, month and a half ago. You know, I recently yeah, about that. Uh, and that's it's a pretty grueling uh, school to go through motor school first of all, and then to uh, go through the, the instructor school. And part of of his instructor school, he was helping with the uh, the motor school they had going on out at uh, the EBO range and. Uh, in Lehigh at Camp Williams and helping with uh, the other new officers from around the state who were uh, uh, trying to certify as, as motor officers. And uh, part of that is they go on a long ride uh, where they ride together, learn how to uh, ride in following each other. And you know, there, there's just a lot of things that it's not as easy as it looks uh, riding those motorcycles and riding together. And so uh, Part of their, their training, they do go on this long ride. Uh, on this particular time, they were uh, out on the west side of Utah Lake when, uh, as will happen at times, uh, somebody will have have a mishap, which tends to cause a chain reaction down the line. And one of the, uh, the new officers going through training, a bunch of them went down. One of them uh, went down hard and uh, was in critical condition. Uh, and in, in a pretty bad way. And uh, Jake was uh, one of the first ones there to go over, administer first aid, utilize the uh, the equipment and the training that, uh, that he'd been given on how to uh, to do that and was able to help stabilize uh, this officer from another agency until uh, Life Flight and uh, medical personnel could get there and, uh, and get him to the hospital. So we were, uh, we were proud of Jake for everything that he does, but we we're grateful that he was there and uh, had the cool head and the, uh, the know-how to uh, uh, put that to, to work to uh, help save the life of this, uh, this other officer. Thanks, Jake. Thank you. Jake, yeah, we sure appreciate it. Thanks, and uh, hey, we want you to say something. We know you probably don't want to, but <laughs> go ahead. We'll turn the time over to you. Uh, yeah, like the chief was saying, it's uh, it's nothing that, um, you ever want to have to do all the first aid and trauma training that we get. Um, but I'm especially appreciative that, uh, we had the equipment in our motorcycles out of the 30 something bikes that were there that day. I was the only one with a trauma kit in the motorcycle. Um, I can't say for sure that that helped or saved his life, but it definitely, uh, definitely helped things until life I was able to get there. Um, I'm super appreciative of the uh, recognition that came along with this. It's not something that we uh, in this profession, we expect to get whenever we do things. It's kind of a thankless job at times. Um, but I am extremely grateful that um, I did get the recognition. Um, doesn't make it any less or uh, more special that it came from kind of a traumatic event. Um, but I'm glad I was able to be there and help out along with everybody else that was there that day. And I'm especially uh, appreciative of the city and the chief uh, for getting this new equipment after that help and that, uh, that helps keep us safer. And uh, we appreciate me, my family, and uh, I'm, I'm happy to be in Murray. And I'm appreciative of you guys. So thank you. Thanks, Jake. And we, we sure appreciate you. And uh, 
and I'll tell you, it did save save the life. So we are really appreciative for you and, and for your service. So any 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 comments? I'd just like to say congratulations, Jake, and thank you so much for your service to Murray. We really appreciate having you out there. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, Dale. All right. Thank you, Jake. We'll move on now to consider a joint resolution of the mayor and the municipal council encouraging increased water conservative conservation due to the drought conditions. Mayor Camp presenting. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I um, appreciate the council uh, joining uh, with me in uh, this resolution. All of us know uh, what dire uh, circumstances we find ourselves in with this drought, uh, with not only uh, uh, the water, uh, potential water shortage, but the temperatures. I, it says here on my device that it's cooled down to 102 now uh, this afternoon. So. Uh, my, the water managers tell us uh, that we have enough water uh, right now, but if we wait to conserve until we don't have enough, it's too late. So that's uh, the message that we uh, want to get out. So I'll go ahead and read this uh, resolution. This is a joint resolution of the Mayor and Municipal Council encouraging increased water conservation due to drought conditions. Whereas the state of Utah experienced below average statewide snowpack during the recent winter months and in the months of April and May. And this, the state saw even drier conditions with an average of 0.3 inches of precipitation accumulated in valley locations. And whereas counties and cities across the state are experiencing drought conditions and record high temperatures, and whereas the forecast predicts the possibility of poor water supply conditions for the summer months, and whereas many of the reservoirs around the state that provide drinking and irrigation water are at less than half of their capacities. And whereas extreme drought conditions threaten to access, threaten access to safe, reliable drinking water from wells, streams, and reservoirs. And whereas water is a valuable resource and an essential element for life that should be used wisely and as efficiently as possible to provide a stable water supply for the community. And whereas Mayor Blair Camp and the Murray City Municipal Council join with Governor Cox to encourage all Utahns to increase their efforts to conserve water. Now therefore be it resolved by the Mayor and the Murray City Municipal Council that we ask Murray residents and businesses to implement the following water conservation practices. One, don't water the lawn more than two times per week. Two, don't water when it's windy. Three, don't water between 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. Four, prioritize your watering to impact the most valuable plants in your landscape first. Trees, shrubs, perennials, annuals, then grass. Grass is resilient and will enter dormancy during times of drought and high temperatures and recover when conditions improve. Five, mow your lawn higher. Set mower blades to three to four inches. Taller grass means deeper roots that can access water that is deeper in the soil. Tall grass also shades roots and soil to reduce water loss through evaporation. Six, manually shut off systems during rain and wind events in areas without rain and wind sensors. Seven, audit and repair all landscape irrigation systems so they are operating at maximum efficiency. And eight, install a smart irrigation controller where possible. And uh, that is the resolution. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just so you know, we have an irrigation system that's a hell of a lot smarter than I am. I can't figure it out, so we have that covered. <laughs> Anything from the council? No, I'm just really glad that um, we're doing this, and as much as we can get it out to our citizens to let them know, I think it's really, really helpful. And 
with that, I'll make a motion if you're ready. I'm ready. Okay. I will make a motion to adopt the joint resolution of the Mayor and Municipal Council encouraging increased water conservation due to drought conditions. Do I have a second? I'll second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Brooke? Ms. Turner? Aye. Mr. Held? Aye. Ms. Martinez? Aye. Mr. Cox? Aye. Okay, thank you, Mayor and Council, for that. We'll thank move you. on to citizen comments. Do we have any citizen comments? We did not receive any or have anyone sign up to make any on the citizen comments. Okay, thank you. We'll close that. We have nothing on the consent agenda. We'll move on to public hearings. We have uh, consider an ordinance vacating the municipal utility easement located at approximately 434 West Asser, what is that? Asser, Assertion Way, Murray, Utah. What is it? Ascension. That's Ascension. it, Ascension. Murray Ascension. City, Salt Lake County, uh, Salt Lake City or Salt Lake County, State of Utah. Bruce Turner presenting. Hello, Bruce. Hello, Council. <laughs> I'd like to thank you for this opportunity. Uh, um, this right away. You're freezing up, Bruce. Oh, sorry. How's that? That's better. Thank you. This right away is something that we used uh, a while ago to have an underground power line in. And when um, Security National came in and built their new buildings, we were asked and paid to move our power lines over into a new part of their property. And this right away is what's left over that just needs to be vacated. Um, we no longer have any power lines in there or do we need that for anything? The little yellow square is the parcel that we need um, the right away removed from or that we need to vacate. Okay, thank you. You did a good job presenting this also meeting of the whole. Does anyone have any questions? No, you want a motion? With that, I'll take a motion. Okay, thanks, Bruce. Uh, you bet. I move that uh, we approve. Uh, or adopt the ordinance vacating a municipal utility easement located at approximately 434 West Ascension Way, Murray City, U Murray City, Salt Lake City County, excuse me, Salt Lake County, State of Utah. Do I have a second? I'll second. It's been moved and seconded, Brooke. Ms. Turner? Aye. Mr. Hells? Aye. Ms. Martinez? Aye. Mr. Cox. Aye. A second on the agenda. That was a public hearing. Do we need to open it for, yeah. Let's move back. We I forgot to open it for public comment. Do we have any public we, comment? We do not. Okay, thank you. Are we good to move on? Or do we want to vote again? Okay, thank you. All right, number two, consider an ordinance adopting the final 2021-2022 fiscal year budget for Murray City, including the library fund budget. Brenda Moore, presenting. So since we um, talked about the budget on June 1st, I've added two things. Um, the county auditor came out with the projected growth in our property tax. So I have increased the property tax revenue by $127,673 for the general fund with the offset going to non-departmental miscellaneous expense. And then um, for the library fund, I increased their property tax revenue by $33,496 and that offset will go towards building their reserve balance. 
Um, those are the only changes that were made. Um, I also will add the council intent document to the final budget document. And um, once the ordinance is signed, it will get put into the, the final um, budget document and posted on the website. Thank you, Brenda. Any questions? Okay, we, did, we didn't receive any additional public hearing comments. So we will, this is a continuation of a public hearing from June the 1st, so we'll move on. Do I have a motion to adopt? I will make the motion to adopt the final 2021-2022 fiscal year budget for Murray City, including the library fund budget. Do I have a second? I'll second. It's been moved and seconded. Brooke? Ms. Turner? Aye. Mr. Hells? Aye. Ms. Martinez? Aye. Mr. Cox? Aye. Okay, it passes. Thank you. Number three, consider an ordinance related to land use, amends the zoning map, for the properties located at 6556, 6562, 6566 South Jefferson Street, Murray City, uh, Utah from R18 single family low density to R16 single family medium density application or applicant Derek Allen, Land Forge Incorporated. Melinda Greenwood, Jared Hall presenting. Uh, thank you. So um, this is, as you said, a request for a zoning map amendment uh, made by Derek Allen and Landforge. The three properties that are involved on Jefferson Street, let's see, that you can see there, I should be, am I sharing this? Yeah, okay. The three properties that you can see there on Jefferson Street are three single family homes. There are a lot of outbuildings on a couple of these. Um, they total about 2.68 acres. They're currently in the R18 zone, and the uh, application is to amend that zoning, this current zoning, from R18 to R16. Um, the general plan, um, the general plan calls for this area to be this uh, no, that you see, this color that you see here is the designation of low density residential. Um, the low density residential designation actually does include the R16 zone, so there's no request here for a general, man, a general plan amendment or a general plan's future land use map amendment, as we have on some other items, uh, just the existing zoning to be amended to R16 from R18. That is the only request. A um, couple of things to note here as well. This property is in on Jefferson Street in the Fashion Place West small area plan that was recently adopted. And in that small area plan, um, that plan identified four sub areas and they're differing in, in purpose and intent. And this particular property is in the sub area one that was identified as kind of a stable, large residential district where changes when they were to be considered should be smaller in scale and more context sensitive. Uh, that's what you can see here. The single unit, or sorry, I'm just gonna read this real quickly. The single unit neighborhoods within the Fashion Place West study area are well established and are are an asset of great value to the city. These neighborhoods should be preserved with the exception of infill development where underdeveloped parcels exist within the neighborhoods. Using development along Winchester to buffer the neighborhood can also create a wider range of housing choice within the area. Uh, this, this area, this, this 2.68 acres does fall in that sub area one. So it's underdeveloped and infill can be considered, but it should be considered at a scale that's more appropriate. Uh, we felt like Mr. Um, Allen's request for R16 from R18 represented a, an appropriate uh, increase in density, nothing too drastic, and one that could be handled with uh, sensitivity to the neighboring properties that are single family in nature. Um, there are some differences in the R18 zone and the R16 zone, uh, showing those here. Most of the conditional uses are the same. Both of them allow PUDs and subdivisions as a conditional use. The main difference between the two zones is in the area that's required for lots. Uh, lots in the R18 zone are required to be 8,000 square feet and in the R16, 6,000 square feet. Um, heights for structures in the R18 are slightly um, allowed slightly higher, 35 feet versus 30 feet. And front yard setbacks in the R16 are allowed to be slightly less, 20 feet as opposed to 25. And then the side yards as well. 
Uh, aside from that, the zones are very similar. It's mainly just allowing a slight increase in the density through that lot size requirement that's slightly less. Uh, the Planning Commission did hold a public hearing April 15th. I think it was April 15th, it's underneath that screen on Zoom. But anyway, April 15th, there were 80 notices mailed out for a 400 foot radius. There were some co public comments received, four public comments with concerns about, most of the concerns that we received were about density increases and subdivision on the property creating issues on Jefferson Street that doesn't have good public facilities, not good sidewalks, um, things like that. Uh, new development is when we have a chance to get those kind of things uh, in the new development area. And then again, to start the ball rolling to get improvements in this area that really that really should be done or at least considered and a plan formed to get those improvements put in place. And that Fashion Place West small area plan also calls for that. So. Uh, we are supportive as a staff of those kind of things moving forward. The Planning Commission also forwarded a recommendation of approval with a six to zero vote uh, to the commission. Um, we did find as a staff and the Planning Commission found that the general plan supports this change. The zone change was considered based on that 2017 general plan and the considerations of it, as well as that uh, um, Fashion Place West small area plan. And we are recommending that you approve that change one thing to keep in mind as we as we took comments from the public, and this is a concern that comes up often with zone change requests, uh, this application is just for the zoning map amendment. If the zoning map is amended by the council, uh, any development of the property requires additional applications. Those go through the public process as well with the planning commission. And in this case, those, those applications would be for subdivision uh, in that R16 zone. Uh, do you have any questions for staff at this point? Any questions? Is the applicant online? Does he, he or she want to talk? He is, I believe. Uh, I am online. Go ahead, Mr. Allen. Derek Allen with LandForge. Uh, we've had the pleasure of working with staff uh, through this process to date. A number of members of the, the local community in the neighborhood, and uh, we look forward to working with them closely on next steps. We fully recognize and appreciate Murray's process in terms of public hearings throughout the PUD and planning process uh, to make sure we're able to build the best project possible, one that hopefully every member of the community can be proud of. Um, I guess just on that note, uh, I would say that we take this uh, very seriously in terms of the responsibility and obligation we have to make sure that our efforts go to improve the neighborhood and we look forward to presenting a plan subsequently uh, that shows that very thing. So I appreciate your time and consideration that will allow us to move forward tonight. Hey, thank you. Any questions for Mr. Al? All right, I'll open up the public hearing. Do we have any comments for the public hearing? We did receive some comments. We pre-recorded them before the meeting, so I'll have Patty play those comments. Okay, thank you. received three public comments for the Jefferson Street Rezone. The first one is from Stephen Bequist, Berquist. Hello, Murray City Council. I come before you to relate my concerns about the zone change from R18 to R16. Here are a couple of concerns about the zone change and some reasons why it should not be changed until the items are updated. First of all, many people in this area are concerned about the increased traffic that will occur due to an additional 19 homes being built in this area, as at this time there are no sidewalks for residents to walk to avoid vehicles because Jefferson Street is already a narrow street and the and the city placed electronic speed limit signs on Jefferson and Lester to curb speeding, yet I still see many cars going above the speed limit and barely avoiding the people who are walking or children who are riding their bikes. If one car is parked on Jefferson Street, then the driver has to maneuver to the far side of the road to avoid the vehicle, which then leaves no space for any pedestrians. Sidewalks should be installed on Jefferson Street, Travis James Lane, and Lester Avenue, as the Murray Planning Commission stated that many people from this area would be walking to tracks instead of using their cars, and sidewalks are a more safe alternative than walking in the street. Safety also brings up the issue of lighting. Jefferson Street is dimly lit, and in the winter months, it is difficult to see anyone when walking to and from tracks as the light posts are spread out far and few in between. Please consider to update these large tall light posts to shorter and more abundant posts with LED lighting. Changing the street lamps to LED would save on electricity and would add to a more safe walking zone on these streets. 
Second, what about the utilities which include water, sewer, and the electrical grid? I live in Lisa Ray Circle and a couple of years ago, one new house was built in the circle. Because of this one new home, I do not have the water pressure I once enjoyed. I used to be able to shower and have someone flush the toilet and there was no change in the water pressure. Today, if someone flushes the toilet, the shower goes down and it is difficult to wash the soap completely off my body. This also occurs in the morning when people are watering their lawns and also many are getting up to get ready for work or school. It seems to be that this valuable resource can only be stretched so far and, that, and it's at its limit especially with the seasonal drought with, that is occurring. With these additional homes, will my water pressure become even more diminished? The sewer, water, and electrical systems have not been updated in this area for a long time. Can these systems manage all the new homes that will be built on these properties? And will Murray City be willing to update these utility systems before the construction occurs? If Murray City does not have the monies to update these infrastructure systems now, when will they be updated? Infrastructure is an immense topic in the news today, and these include item, the items discussed above. It is important to provide the residents of this area with updated water, sewer, electrical, slash lighting, and also sidewalks before an additional residential property can be developed, where more residents will be placed, will place the burden on the older and outdated infrastructure systems. This is why I asked the Murray City Council to vote no on approving this change from R18 to R16 because the outdated infrastructure is not ready for the additional 19 homes. There are homes adjacent to this area that have large amounts of space in their backyards and these individuals will also be given the chance to sell it to a developer and those future areas can be rezoned for R16 if the groundwork is set in place for updates on, these, uh, on the aforementioned issues. Thank you. The next comment is from the Christiansons to whom it may concern. I am writing you today to express my concern for the amendment on Jefferson Street. I am a resident who resides on Jefferson Street. I see firsthand the cars that continually speed down Jefferson Street thanks to the speed sign that was put in place a couple of years ago. It has not seemed to slow people down from using Jefferson Street as a shortcut from State Street to Winchester. However, passing the amendment is only going to add to the problem of more cars and our already busy street with no sidewalks. I have young children who walk to school, ride bikes to friends' houses, and I am terrified every day, every time they leave because of our, the safety of our street. Passing this amendment is only going to make our street busier and more dangerous. Please take into consideration before passing this amendment the end consumer, me. I love this neighborhood and I know my neighbors do as well. That is why we are expressing our opinions. The person coming in to change the zoning will build a bunch of houses, make his millions and walk away and never to look back. They will not be the ones dealing with the busy road, wondering if their kids will be safe walking to school. They walk away and we are the ones left with the neighborhood full of houses and cars that we would rather not have. Please look at this as if it were your neighborhood. Thank you for listening and please think of us who remain in the neighborhood after all is said and done. Sincerely, the Christian Sims. <clears throat> the next comment is from Carla Clark. I would like to express my objections to the zoning change R18 to R16 for the properties located at 6556, 6562, and 6566 Jefferson Street. This change request is not suitable for the current road conditions within our neighborhood. Our streets were designed for small rural homes with large lots and low traffic levels, not for the current growth and associated traffic. Lester and Jefferson are the main access roads and both are narrow streets with only patches of sidewalks along Lester and no sidewalks on Jefferson. While Traxxas is frequently cited as the answer to our dangerous roads, I would like to point out that Trax has been around for at least 20 years now and very few people within the neighborhood use it as a main transportation, primarily because one, Trax is cost prohibitive. For a family of four, two adults and two youth, the cost of a round trip day pass would be $20 a day or a monthly pass would be $255. That's over $3,000 a year. Two, track lines provide limited access within our metropolitan area and bus transfers can easily triple or quadruple travel times. With that said, even if tracks usage were increased, the only way to get to tracks is to A, walk along the dangerous narrow roads without sidewalks, or B, drive, thereby increasing traffic. I am a longtime resident of this neighborhood, and as both a driver and a pedestrian, I am well aware of how 
how precarious it can be. Cars frequently park on the side of the road, effectively reducing traffic to a single lane, making it difficult for both drivers and pedestrians. As a frequent pedestrian, I have to be highly aware of traffic from both directions, with city noise making it difficult to hear cars coming from behind. It becomes even more hazardous with cars parked on the side of the road, garbage cans on trash day, and ice, snow, and road spray in the winter. It's no wonder, ironically, that so many parents drive their children to school after busing was stopped as we are considered to be within walking distance of the school. While the new development does require sidewalks along the distance of the development itself, these small patches of sidewalks don't really take away the danger. In my opinion, walking in and out of traffic is more dangerous, not less. Over the years, a few small housing developments have been built in this area, but those small developments have a cumulative effect on traffic with Leicester and Jefferson becoming increasingly dangerous. While these developments have also brought great people into our neighborhood, the fact remains that these roads are not designed for the level of traffic we are seeing. While the argument has been that the zoning change would only add a few more homes, it only adds to the accumulation and sets a precedence for other underdeveloped areas in the neighborhood. I have no doubt that these two will eventually be developed and with the precedence for zoning to R16, the problem will be further ex exacerbated. Over the years, plans for sidewalks have been discussed, but nothing ever comes of it. Our roads are simply not wide enough and the cost is too expensive. So in spite of the recent talk of plans for sidewalks or a potential grant for sidewalks, until actual sidewalks are in place along the full length of both Leicester and Jefferson, a zone change should never be considered. Even with the current R18 zoning, the traffic situation will continue to get worse and R16 zoning will only intensify the problem. Sincerely, Carla Clark. And those were the comments we received. Okay, thank you. Do we have any other comments? Okay, I'll close the public hearing then and bring it back to the council. Are there any questions or comments? Uh, how many more houses would that be? The R one from the R one six to R one eight. That's a that's a great question. It's difficult to say without looking at a subdivision, but probably four. It's probably four more dwelling units. Um, all together. So, and I think as we we talked about it in the uh, in the committee, the whole meeting, it's uh, the R18. So it's not like this is zoned agriculture. This is R18 zoning. So it's developable right now by right as R18. And you're probably talking about a four unit difference altogether. Um, and the, the other thing that I think is worth noting with with those concerns is we we have the exact same concerns um, about sidewalks and and mobility as a staff. And that's what came up in the Fashion Place West plan. We need to find a way to address that. And this single project will not address all of that. We can't get all of Jefferson Street mm -hmm. sidewalked and curbed appropriately with a single development. But we do have two other subdivisions coming near Jefferson and on Jefferson that will provide additional parts of sidewalk and curb and gutter. So right now we have a moment where we can finally establish a width for Jefferson and an area for um, for those improvements on the side of the road, a pavement width and a, an improvement width. This is the right moment to do that. And then we can move forward finding some sort of plan or putting in motion some plan to get the other improvements that ought to be there. Um, it might take a couple of years, but we, we, we're very committed to doing that as staff. Would that development, um, would that require sidewalks? Yes, yeah. They have frontage on, they have three different lots that all front Jefferson, there'd be sidewalk and improvements in front of all of those. Um, and nearby on the east side of Jefferson, we have a subdivision coming through um, that was actually approved a while ago and elapsed and is being resubmitted uh, that will provide sidewalk on the east side of Jefferson as well. So like I say, it's a, it's a good moment for us to establish that pavement width that's never really been nailed down. So it's in the process. Of, yeah. Okay. Yep. I just oh, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, I just want to say thank you for speaking to that. Um, the questions and concerns uh, regarding sidewalks are are serious and valid, and so I'm I'm glad we're talking about moving forward with improving the walkability of that area safely. Um, is uh, speaking to the, just the question of lighting is that a part of the long term fashion placed? West small area plan? It, it is, but only indirectly. It's not as directly addressed by the Fashion Place West plan, but that's part of the pedestrian experience. And that's a great point. Uh, a few scattered really tall poles are not appropriate for that 
kind of street. That's a local street. For that street. residential area. Yeah. For that residential area, we ought to look at lighting too, and that's not something that we've done yet. Okay. But this, uh, this request, just to repeat, is supported by both the 2017 general plan and the Fashion Place West small area plan. Yes. It's appropriate and matches those things. Uh, I have one more question. Also, the infrastructure issue has that been, yeah. Yeah. has yeah. that been considered? That's a great question. What have we found out about that? So, in infrastructure in the area, it gets reviewed. The zone change requests get reviewed and vetted by all the different public works departments as well. So, sewer and stormwater and water and power have all looked at this uh, zone change and the potential increase in density. And all of them have said there's there's no comment to to be made. Um, for a potential number of units, it's not going to impact them in any way that we can't deal with through the process of developing the land. So I can't tell you that it will or will not require an upsizing of, of water pipes or sewer pipes uh, or looping of something or additional lines. But anything that they looked at potentially needing, they didn't feel like was a problem. And they can require that through development. So, right. And they have, can require that yeah, sorry, through definitely. development. Yeah. Okay, great. Absolutely. So it has been considered. And yeah, and it will get considered on a more detailed level if it's approved for a change and goes through subdivision, then at subdivision we'll really get down into what exactly needs to be done. Okay. But uh, the initial feeling from their initial review is that there's nothing that we would need to require that would be so far out of bounds that we couldn't get it through development. Okay. okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. I, uh, <clears throat> I spoke briefly in the committee of the whole. I asked you to make me feel good about no sidewalks. And you pointed out a few things. I've spent couple of weeks thinking about it and I still don't feel good about no side. Sure. I've gone over there, Jan and I have gone over there, I've taken a couple of council members over there and I, I realize the, the uh, property owner has the right to develop his property and I support that. Mm -hmm. But with the narrowness of that road, absence of sidewalks, absence of lighting and I realize in this in this particular uh, piece of property, it's hard to decide. It could be three, could be five, could be four additional homes. But that's still 18 more homes on that approximately, yeah. 16 to 18. And that throws traffic back on there. And, and this, this is a unique area because it's old, older, and... When you look at that area, there's no room for sidewalks. The lawns are, you know, not, well, we can always make room, I guess. Right. But they'll step off their porch onto the sidewalk almost. So I, I have a hard time going from R18 to R16 on this particular piece of property. And it has to do with safety of the kids, of the people that are walking that street, the narrowness of the street, the dimly lit street. Uh, I have, I've, I've thought about it a lot and I really have a hard time, uh, coming up with an approval of, of changing the zoning. I appreciate the work sure. you've done and I've thought about it a lot, but I've been over there and I've looked and it's just a very cramped area and there are going to be more homes there. And there, as, as you said, there could be more subdivisions. So mm -hmm. by the end of the day, if we do this and do it with the other ones, could be 15, 20 more homes there on top of what's already going to be developed. And sidewalks are coming. I appreciate that. But that doesn't help the people that are there now uh, navigate those roads. Sure. I, I, can, I can appreciate that concern. I, in looking at the, the roadway, I, I, and I've been down there myself too and looked at it a lot on the, on the aerials, I think part of the reason it, it feels so cramped is because you're looking at what's been paved s so far. There is more right of way to be used and that's not gonna go down easy as we, as we expand what's there in pavement and then get um, improvements that ought to be on that road. Um, I just feel like as, as far as the property goes, it's, we don't have a bunch of undevelopable properties left over there. We have a few developable pieces and they're in the R18 zone. Ultimately, they could all be developed. And with housing pressures being what they are in the valley right now, you're gonna see subdivisions come whether they're R18 or R16, and that's gonna put almost the same number of cars on that road. It's a good moment to get something established. It's gonna to have to be established at some point. Jer so Jared, if this, so if this doesn't get changed, the, the zoning, 
stays uh, R16. Uh-huh. Or R18. Or, sorry, R18, because we want to go to R18. Um, does it, so t- tell me a little bit. So it can still be developed. Yeah. Yeah. Without. Absolutely. You'd still get sidewalks in front of the areas that you get, and we'd still, we'd still ask for that. No, no matter what happens there, if subdivision happens, we're going to ask for the improvements on the road. You are going to ask well, for always, improvements. Always, yeah. And, and, and that's the case, for example, in the, uh, in the other subdivision that I mentioned on the east side of the road, we're going to be asking for sidewalks and curbs and gutters to be established in front of those properties that haven't been established heretofore. So that's going to happen regardless. And we're going to need to set that width and that improvement width as well and, and start trying to get some of those improvements put in. The remainder of it, there have been homes, as I think what Councilman Cox is talking about, there, there are homes along Jefferson Street, and they're at certain distances from that pavement width, right? So the challenge is going to be that there's not going to be a nice uniform 25-foot uh, distance. A couple of things going for us in establishing that right-of-way width and getting sidewalks and things uh, of that nature, even though they're a little closer than normal, the, the garages on those homes that have been built in the past are set behind the homes. So there's still room in a driveway for people to get past out of the road, uh, even if front yards are shorter, 15, 16, 18 feet. Um, so we can still work through some of those things. So I think it's a workable solution. It's going to take time, and we're not going to get all of it at once. But we're not going to get all of it at once, whether we change the zoning to R16 or R18 or leave them at all R18. Um, the reason staff supports it going R16 is because of that Fashion Place West plan that says, it's a good stable residential area. If you invite development with slightly higher densities, that serves the purpose of creating a little bit of density around that station, but a, a managed sort of context sensitive development. And it brings, um, it brings more amenities to those developments too. So uh, we're hoping for that kind of thing. But yeah, you, we'd get improvements either way. We have to look at that situation on Jefferson. It needs to be dealt with. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? I didn't. I just wanted to say that. I mean, I have I have concerns about no sidewalks, but it, to me, it seems like a small number of units in addition. Um, when we have a housing supply issue and it's still single family, and we're going to have difficulty with the sidewalk width either way, we're going to have difficulty or time. It's going to take time to develop some of those things that we wish the, the area had right now either way. But it's the amount of units I'm comfortable with in the, um, in the effort of increasing housing supply um, for those asking for it. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Okay, I'll look for a motion. I'll make that motion that we approve the ordinance relating to land use, amending the zoning map for the properties located at 6556, 6562, and 6566 South Jefferson Street, Murray City, Utah, from R18, which is single family low density, to R16, single family medium density. I'll second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Brooke? Ms. Turner? Aye. Mr. House? Aye. Ms. Martinez? Aye. Mr. Cox? No. <clears throat> Excuse me. No. <laughs> okay. Three to one. It passes. All right. We'll move on to number four. Consider an ordinance related to land use amendments and general plan from parks and open spaces to low density residential to medium density residential at and amends the zoning map from A1 to R16 and RM15 for the property located approximately 935 West Bullion Street, Murray City, Utah. Applicant Hamlet Development. Melinda and Jared presented. Hey, thank you. Um, as you said, this is the property 935 West Bullion Street, um, just over eight acres. And you can see that shown here in uh, highlighted in red, the uh, communications facility on the east and another property on the west that's vacant. Um, this is an application. Um, the one that we just finished talking about was just for zone map amendment. This application does involve a general plan amendment as well that we'll talk about briefly. I think we'll talk about briefly. There we go. Um, that's the right one, right? Okay. One of the, one of the questions that we had... Um, as we, as we reviewed this application, these applications with the Planning Commission, 
we did receive a lot of opposition, a, a lot of uh, comments from neighboring property owners that were opposed to it. And, and when it was reviewed for the second time, because it was reviewed twice, the first application um, was for a, a zone change from A1 to RM15, the entire eight acres. And the, the applicant in that uh, Hamlet development at the end of that public hearing we first held withdrew his applications and came back uh, with an application that we're gonna review tonight. And all of that to say, when it came back again, uh, we did get some comments from folks saying, why is this even before the Planning Commission when everyone is opposed to this? There's almost no one that thinks it's a good idea. We did have a few positive comments, um, but that question got asked. And the simple answer is really just that, that these applications were made and we are obligated as a city to review those applications if they're, if they're made in, in good faith. So we're here, um, Planning Commission did review it again and I'm gonna talk about the differences in the second application. It was withdrawn completely and remade. Um, but with all that said, the council tonight is looking at a general plan amendment and a zone map amendment. Um, there is a, a proposed development for subdivision that has not come before the planning commission, has not been applied for. We don't have those applications, but it was reviewed in a neighborhood meeting by Hamlet Development with um, neighboring property owners. So a lot of folks in that area are aware of, of what he wants to do and that has colored a lot of the comments. And so, uh, as we talked about in the committee, the whole meeting we, we have, uh, and when we met with the planning commission as well, we did show that plan and we'll show you tonight again, because it does in fact, in this case now, in the new applications, it shapes the way that he's made the zone change applications. Um, but again, just to, to be clear, there is no application for subdivision or or land development on the on the docket tonight. It is just a, a, a request for a zone map amendment and a supporting general plan amendment. If the council approves, there would be other applications that would go to the planning commission for those other developments. Um, again, this is that uh, this the property we're talking about. It does total about eight acres, and there are two parcels here, and that's important. Just as we go forward, talking about what's coming next. It is in the agriculture zone, A1, and you can see this yellow colored zone around it, that is R18 zoning. A lot of the properties in this area, the, the great majority of the properties in this area are either agriculture or, a, or R18 zoning. Um, the future land use map designations of these properties are low density. You can see all this yellow, that's low density residential, just like we were talking about on Jefferson Street just, just a moment ago. And then this second piece that's part of that application was left in the parks and open space designation when we uh, adopted the Murray general plan for 2017. That was a mistake. We assumed it was part of the power corridor and to be preserved that way. So we left it in the open space designation. So we've treated most of our analysis of the general plan for, for a change from low density residential to medium density residential, not from open space to medium density residential. Um, just really quickly, that's, I'm missing a slide, I think. This is the developer's concept plan that was shown um, to, well, this is not what was shown to the neighbors at first in the neighborhood meeting, but it's what he came up with after he received comments from the neighborhood um, folks. He wanted to reduce the density overall and put single family homes out front, out on Bullion Street, you've got Bullion Street up here, and then townhomes in the back. The original proposal when he was asking for his own change to all RM15 was all townhomes, arranged in kind of an L with a large park out in front on, on Bullion Street. Um, this new concept that he put together, when he came to the Planning Commission, and there were still concerns from residents and, and neighboring property owners about the potential density of RM15 zoning, even though this is what he was proposing. RM15 zoning could allow 90 or 100 units the acre plus, and he was only proposing- Jared, how much? I'm sorry, 90 to what? 90 to 100 and some odd. There were a lot of numbers thrown around, okay. and I don't have it right in front of me anymore. Okay. But RM15 will let you do 12 units the acre, so at eight point some odd acres, 96 units. Okay. Um, this is 75 units, and that's what he's proposing. So he wanted to come up with a, a method of, of reducing that density and committing to that density without, um, without people being nervous that he was going to go higher. Um, to do that, I'm just looking for a slide. There we go. I'm going to go back to the next slide in just a moment. Um, this, this particular proposal um, for zone change and map amendment for the general plan is to two parts, R16 out on the front 3.36 acres and RM15 on the back 4.64 acres. That effectively limits the density that can be done on any project here, whether it's his project or someone else's project, to about 75 units per acre. You can get 20 lots out here in the front when you take out the public roads. 
and you can get those 56, 55 units in the back. Um, he does have a couple of other constraints um, that we'll talk about in a moment, but I did want to make sure that it was understood too that it, this, the other concerns a lot of times with zone changes and potential development are with utilities um, and city services. Water, sewer, engineering, stormwater, fire, police, planning, building power, everyone has vetted this particular zone change and everyone in the city departments for those provision of services feels good about the change. Um, no concerns were raised in that, in that review. They would all, again, have a chance to review the project. If a, if a zone change is approved and a project comes forward, a subdivision, those same departments will review that subdivision and make sure that we get whatever upgrades to services we need to serve that, not just to serve that uh, development, but to maintain services to everyone else as well. Jared, just yeah. while we're on that, yeah. would a subdivision ever be able to be built that would have roads too narrow for emergency vehicles to access? No. We, we, have, we, um, we don't subdivide new lots. We have a rule against subdividing new single family lots on private roads. Um, but even, even so, we do some townhomes on, I'm just gonna go back to this plan for a second. We can do townhomes um, on, a, on a private lane, as long as there's access to a public road or frontage on a public road of some kind. But even in that case, this gets vetted for emergency service so that a fire truck or emergency service vehicle can get into these areas. We don't do narrow access ways, even beyond just narrow roads. So even, even private access ways, they'll, they'll get vetted for emergency service access. Go ahead, yeah, Melinda. And anything that is subdivided along a public road has to be, the road has to be constructed to the city standards. So with a private road, they can deviate from those standards because the city is not going to maintain it. It still has the vetting, as Jared said, through police and fire access. Um, but when it's a public road that the city is going to own and maintain, it has to be constructed to our standards. So essentially, to answer your question, if it's going to be a public road, no, it wouldn't be allowed to be constructed more narrow than what our subdivision standards allow for. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, so going back to this, just, um, and, we'll, and we can come back to these slides if we need to, to make sure everyone's um, understanding exactly what's going on. But this is Mr. Brodsky's proposal to guarantee the density limited to 75 units the acre, as opposed to whatever potential to up to 96 and, and beyond that people were worried about with the RM15. Um, the general plan, one of the other questions that we, we talked about a lot with the planning commission was whether the general plan should be changed. There are lots of instances when we would recommend against making a change to the general plan. Um, but the, but the idea that the general plan can never be modified is just, is just not, is not correct. We should be willing to make modifications to the general plan when it's necessary. We update the general plan every five to 10 years. And in a growing community, as you can see from some of these uh, other cities and us included, you have to make changes to the general plan as you respond to changes in the market and changes in conditions. Yes. Jared, um, it re I mean, I know we've done this, but tell me, we, I want to get this on record. Have we changed the general plan before? Many, many times. Okay. We, we amend the general plan many times. Okay. Um, so right now, yeah, this is just the data from last year. Last year we amended, well, we processed five general plan amendments. Two of them were completed. I can't remember why we didn't complete the other three, but we did process five. Oh, they were withdrawn. Thank you. So sometimes things don't work out, but two amendments were done and we did amend the, the, we did amend the zoning map based on general plan and general plan changes seven times. Well, I know I've sat with other council members yeah. throughout the years that have, that have agreed to change the general plan because it's, I mean, I mean, I, I, there's no question, but it's called a general plan. Mm -hmm. I'd like to, I'd like to change that to call a living document. You know what I mean? Because it does. I mean, I know that we want to stick with it, but I've seen, you know, throughout the years I've been here where I've been with council members that have changed that because they felt like there were things that changed. And mm -hmm. we'll talk about some of that later, but yeah, no, we, and, and I, I wholeheartedly agree. We, we have to be able to to look at situations and decide if, if the, if the plan is appropriate or if it does warrant amending with that said, there should be arguments. We shouldn't just change it just to change it, but we need to be able to rely on arguments. Um, in looking at that planning, uh, planning staff first talked to Mr. Brodsky a, a while ago about this and looked at some of the issues that are unique to this property and the way that we have done the general plan here and felt like we could support a change to the general plan 
that would support his zoning map amendment. And to talk about some of those, this is just real quickly, um, the general plan, a, a lot of times people will say, well, we want to stick to this plan. And, and I think it's important for folks to understand this. So I'm going to go through it again, even though we've gone through with the planning commission uh, hearings, et cetera. This is the map, map 5.7 from the general plan. It does identify, it looks a little bit like a zoning map. It's not the zoning map, um, but it, gener it, it identifies different land use categories and puts every single property in the city into one of those categories. Uh, in this case, those two categories are low density residential and open space and parks. Um, and what Mr. Brodsky is asking for is to put them both in medium density residential instead of low density residential. That is just the map, okay? Um, when we recommend an amendment to the map, we take that seriously and we need to find reasons that we would, that we would suggest that it was appropriate. When we do that, uh, this is just some snips from the uh, general plan talking about the current parcels. Both of them right now are in the low density residential and you can see that the the RM6, the RM15 zone that he's requesting does not um, get, it doesn't get called out as a potential zone for that uh, designation. So he's asking for this medium density residential designation instead to get him that RM15. He doesn't want to zone all the property that, but part of it would need that designation. Um, many of the things that, that ought to happen in those zones are called out here, the conditions, the, the impacts, um, and those kind of things. Want to talk, whoops, want to talk real briefly about the different elements, elements of the general plan that apply here that the planning staff feels like apply the most here. There are lots of elements in the plan, in the general plan. We focused on land use and urban design. We felt like these were the most relevant. Land use, urban design, housing and neighborhood and moderate income housing. Um, just to give you an idea, in that land use and urban form element right here, one of the elements, there are 12 objectives and 19 individual strategies. This is all beyond the map. Um, which is to say that Mr. Brodsky has asked for a change and amendment in the map, but these are all the objectives and strategies and goals that either support or don't support that kind of change. All of those could potentially be evaluated, but not all of them are going to be as applicable in each case. So with that said, we looked at neighborhoods and housing and feel like his, uh, his requested amendment um, is supported or by a couple of these different um, goals and strategies. The overall housing goal in neighborhood and housing is to provide a diversity of housing through a range of types and development patterns to expand the options available to existing and future residents. Um, the first objective, or sorry, the third objective in that is to encourage housing options for a variety of age, family size, and financial levels. And then a strategy to support that is to support a range of housing types, including townhomes, row homes, and duplexes, which appeal to younger and older individuals, as well as a variety of population demographics. Um, so this is an opportunity to support that goal of the general plan. We don't have a whole lot of those opportunities in, in an area like this that is so widely already developed as single family, lower density, like R18 and R110. And I'll get to the reasons that we feel like it's appropriate here. But again, most of the city, um, most of the city's land use, especially residentially, is in low density, single family, uh, residential. So it's not a, the, the addition of some missing middle housing like townhomes is not an indication that single family homes are going extinct in the city by any stretch. Um, diverse neighborhoods that are called for in that goal. And again, this is just that same overall, overall goal right there. And then that, again, that objective we cited to encourage a diversity of housing. Diverse neighborhoods. Um, this is a, the Ballantour subdivision, 9th East, 56 South, um, just west of the Macy's. Uh, you have the same kind of mix that he's that Mr. Brodsky is proposing to do with this zone change that he's asking for. Uh, townhomes in the rear and single family homes out on Vine Street. Same kind of density that we're talking about um, for his particular project. Um, we like to see the mix of housing types. There's no better way to, to allow for diversity of incomes in housing developments other than to mix those types of, housings, of, of housing options. So that's one of the things we really wanted to support as staff. Uh, the modern so, income house. Oh, sorry, me. go ahead. Will you go back to that? Yeah, other? sure. So that development is built out, and it was probably approved several years ago, correct? Yeah, yes. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, the modern income housing um, objective in the general plan is very much supported by this, this kind of a suggestion or this kind of a request to add some additional housing types, to add townhomes to this uh, property as opposed to just single-family detached. Um, and again, they're the same kind of objectives that you see in the others. 
uh, strategy here to ensure zoning of residential areas does not prohibit compatible types of housing. Uh, where, we can, where we can add those uh, townhomes and that promotes home ownership as opposed to just apartments or something like that, uh, we feel like that's uh, supported by that strategy. And then this other one, support a range of housing types, including townhomes, row homes, and duplexes, which appeal to younger and older individuals. You'll see that repeated from that housing um, objective as well. But again, that's, as we said before, that's the best way to, in this kind of an environment, as opposed to, to bringing in subsidies or something else, that's the single best way to bring affordability to some of these units, just to make them diverse in their type. Um, chapter five, land use and urban design. Again, the objective is to provide a mix of housing options and residential homes or residential zones. Um, this isn't a, isn't a change, a text amendment to the zone to include it right within the zone, but rather uh, a requested amendment to, to include two different zones that will allow us to mix the housing types. That RM15 zone will allow greater flexibility to mix those housing types and to move those densities around. And the R16 applied to that 3.36 acres will limit that overall density and, and uh, can help us make sure that it's not more than the neighborhood can be comfortable with. Um, this is, again, the project area, and I wanted to talk about some of the, the development constraints and the natural buffers. We talked a lot in our discussion with the Planning Commission and the Committee of the Whole about the natural buffering of the site. One of the reasons that we feel good about Mr. Brodsky's uh, proposal and we wanted to support it as a staff, and and frankly, why the Planning Commission felt good about it as well, or the members that voted for it did, is because of the natural buffering. Uh, this is the power corridor um, that runs the length of the state and is not going away soon. So there's no immediate neighbor adjacent to the project on the west. This is an extension of that power corridor on the south that creates a natural buffer there. The, our own power company, our, our own power department, and, uh, and the police have land here that they use that buffers it from other residential uses. And then Bullion Street provides a natural buffer on the north. Uh, adding to all of that, Mr. Brodsky's intent to add the single family on the north side where Bullion Street provides the only buffer, uh, you really have a well-buffered kind of isolated um, site. Now, it's not directly adjacent to transit, but it's not at the densities that we would require that either. We heard that a lot in comments. There's no real good transit opportunities. Aren't we only supposed to do this kind of density near transit? No, near transit, we do 30 and 40 units the acre plus. This is not that. This is an overall density of about nine units per acre when you factor in the townhomes and the single family. Um, there are some constraints as well that we, we wanted to take into account as we reviewed this site. Uh, there's a cell tower up here in the corner that has to be buffered with 165 feet to any residential uses. That limits your ability to use the site. And that R RM15, as we mentioned, that allows you some density, allows you the density and lets you move the, the units around, get them away from the 165 feet without losing your, your potential number of units. Um, contaminated soil needs to be remediated there. This was part of the High Boy smelter site, as we've talked about in the past. Um, the regrading of the site and soil removal will be extensive uh, because of the nature of the development that has been there in the past and because of the um, contamination. Building demolition, there's a lot of structure there to deal with and clearing the site. Um, that vacant building, it is vacant now. It was in use until up to about two, I want to say two years ago. It was in use until about two, up until about two years ago. Vacant buildings can become problems if it's not, um, it, we'd like to see it developed so the building goes away before it becomes a, a real attractive nuisance. Jared? Yeah. Um, this is one of the things that really concerns me about this site mm -hmm. is the contaminated soil. Sure. Um, so what's to say that, that that soil hasn't leached into the surrounding areas and the surrounding homes? Has anything ever, have there been tests to determine if that's happened? Um, do we know? I mean, it's not just going to stay in that one area unless, you know, there's something done about it. So it's just left to... That's a great, that's a great question, Melinda. Go ahead. So I haven't seen a report about the contaminants that are left on site, but I know that they're typical of this type of contamination from the smelter sites, which we've dealt with other places in Murray. Typically, that contamination isn't leachable. And there's a more technical term than that. Um, but generally, it's, it's not leachable. And so um, that's why the product would have to be removed from the site or contained in a barrier like um, what Mr. Brodsky has done before. He does 
uh, he, he has gone through the process already of submitting a plan, a voluntary cleanup plan to the state, Utah State Department of Environmental Quality. That plan is already approved. I think when he is allowed his turn to speak, he will give you a little bit more detail on that. And that would be an excellent question to ask him since he has actually cleaned up, I think, four other sites within Murray. Yeah, that's one of what I understand. One of the concerns is even if it is cleaned up and contained, that it can still leak. So, yeah, if if it if it was contamination that would be leachable, it would have to be disposed of in a way that it wouldn't contaminate a water source or um, pose a hazard to the public. So, as long as it doesn't get developed, it can sit there indefinitely. But when somebody comes in and starts disturbing the site, that's when um, the state comes in and, and all of those contamination um, elements that are left there have to be disposed of according to their, uh, their standards. And that would be supervised by DEQ? Yeah, the voluntary cleanup program essentially has... Um, all, it has to go through a process of approval through DEQ and then... Um, the contractors, anybody who works on site has to go through what's called HAZWOPER training, um, which is very specific so that they are trained on uh, handling the contaminants and not endangering themselves or the public. And that process does have an oversight through a representative from DEQ. Okay, thank you. You know, before you go on, uh, you, you mentioned the building. Uh, this goes to one of the questions that uh, the public have. There was another contractor that wanted to put homes there. And he talked to me a little bit and took me down and took me on a tour of that office building. And it's just like walking into the twilight zone. You walk in there, there's half eaten sandwiches, there's co coffee with mold on the glasses. There's still family photos. I don't know what happened in there, but they left. There's no doubt about it. Like Chernobyl. Yeah. yeah, like Chernobyl. But the point is, this isn't the first developer that's looked at this. And and that that particular developer wanted to put R16 homes in there and couldn't pencil it out. I'd, I'd love that to happen too, but he couldn't get it to pencil out. Yeah, our understanding, over the years, we've had a lot of developers come and look at this property. And I think... A, a couple of things to consider. One, I believe after they have received the environmental study on the site, uh, th that is cause for most to walk away just because if they don't have a level of experience dealing with remediating contaminated sites, um, they may not feel comfortable. They may not want to develop that type of expertise. And so I think that has dissuaded most people people who have been able to get past that and look at the cost for the contamination and the allowances there of the R18 um, and, and even R16 just have not been able to, I think, financially make that workable when you take all of the constraints onto the site into consideration, which this slide is showing, you know, there's 165 foot setback from the cell phone tower, um, the contaminated soil obviously and um, a lot of other factors that just make it something that is very challenge, challenging to develop. And, uh, you know, I think as far as getting a developer who is willing to deal with the contamination, um, you know, Mr. Brodsky has done that several other times in Murray City. And I, there should be a level of comfort, I think, looking at somebody who's been through that process with the state several times and has even, um, you know, been able to help other developers figure out a process versus somebody who would be doing that for the first time. Um, one of the other, one of the other concerns was traffic. This, the um, developer or the uh, applicant did get a traffic impact study done um, bullion street um, just a couple of points about traffic bullion street is a minor or neighborhood collector it's a 66 foot right away with 40 feet of asphalt curb gutter and sidewalk so it's it's uh, a larger road it's designed to handle up, up to about 5,000 vehicle trips a day it's currently 
counted in the new transfer, master transportation plan data, it's counted about 1,800 vehicle trips per day. This development would add about 640, so it's, it's well within um, what we would expect it to be able to handle. Um, 700 West also is, is classified as a minor arterial. Where you do have um, impacts from the development are at, at intersections. Uh, 7th West and Bullion Street is already a difficult intersection. The real, the real um, result from the traffic study or the traffic impact study was that while there are impacts there, they are not, um, they're not impacts that are going to take it from an acceptable level of service to an unacceptable level of surface, a service during, during peak times. It does have an impact, but not enough to warrant uh, any real changes other than what's, what's shown here, right turn lane uh, for the eastbound approach. And they did recommend for traffic calming, um, changing the location of the speeded signs, the electronic speeding signs, um, and things like that. Uh, narrowing lanes, perhaps, to keep people moving a little slower on bullion, because speed seemed to be the main concern there. You were going to say, Mom, sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to point out the level of service um, is a, a terminology used to describe a convenience factor. So... A level of service A is uh, an intersection where there's essentially no wait at all. B, you may have to wait a couple of seconds or C, um, you know, wait for one car to pass. C is increasing that from a few seconds to uh, more, there's a little bit more congestion and then down um, E and F through uh, the, the level of service to, to, to be failing. Um, so just pointing out that, again, the, the level of service is a convenience factor. Um, oftentimes, the, the public will feel like a traffic impact study will say whether or not a project should be done um, or whether or not a project is going to impact safety concerns. And a, a, a study such as this really doesn't address those type of things. It just looks at... Um, the convenience factor, the number of chips trips generated. Um, and Mr. Brodsky, based on the high level of concerns that came from the neighborhood over there when they had the neighborhood meeting, decided to have a, a the traffic calming study incorporated as well. Um, but just the traffic study that we required for the development, it didn't have any mitigation recommendations. And you get those when the level of service drops to a point where it's not acceptable. So to, to counter on to the findings before the project and after the project, an acceptable level of service is still remaining and there were not any, um, any recommendations or mitigation that would be required based on this um, this development coming through. Melinda. Yeah. So on that, in talking about the the delay that someone would experience depending on the rating, um, I do. Am I understanding correctly that that's throughout the day? That's not at peak times necessarily, because I don't want people listening in to think I've definitely waited longer than that to turn at three thirty, because. That's just absolutely not the yeah. real experience of trying to pick up or drop off at those core peak times. The traffic study, study does denote um, between the peak times and other times. So, um, it, it, but still the traffic or, or the study did not find that even during those peak times that it falls below an acceptable level of service. Okay. So there's definitely not I mean, there is an acknowledgement that during those peak times, there is there is some congestion, there is an inconvenient amount of weight, but outside of those times, it functions essentially at a level of service A, uh, I believe, and then um, during those times, it still is not below the level of service that, that we would not want to see it fall below, which would be um, an E and F, or mm -hmm. an E or an F for sure. Okay. Um, and and preferably, I think that uh, the master transportation plan that you'll be seeing coming to you, um, I think preferably all intersections within the city would function at a level C or above. Sometimes that's just not possible 
But um, it's again, it's not something that falls below that acceptable, that unacceptable level. Okay. And I want to thank you. We had a really uh, robust uh, conversation about traffic during our committee of the whole, which is our workshop meeting. Um, with that, you mentioned that you also looked at traffic information pre-2020. Um, can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, that's been that's been a concern that some residents have brought forward that this traffic study was conducted during the pandemic levels. And so it's it's not valid or the numbers would be skewed. And, and just simply, they've had to devise a way to project numbers or account for that because it is a factor. And, um, and I, I, I actually sat in a meeting last week with our city engineer, Trey Stokes, where we were looking at a traffic impact study that came in on another project. And he felt like based on, um, other projects that had come through in the past in that general area and what those counts were that were pre-pandemic, that this study in particular was a little bit low. So we sat down with the consultant. We, um, we, we provided those studies to them that were done two, three years ago, four years ago, even five years ago, and asked them to look at those numbers and make those adjustments. Um, simply saying that in this case, the city engineer, to my knowledge, did not have any concerns about the numbers that were generated um, within the report. And I believe he understands the methodology that Hills and Associates used to, um, to adjust for those COVID numbers. And, um, and that's one of the things that, uh, one of the reasons why we have a city engineer is so that we can have somebody who represents our interests and understands that technical data and can um, make sure that whatever is submitted to us is something that he's comfortable with. So in a nutshell, the, the numbers were adjusted for COVID. On the correct. Study. They, they were correct. Yes, and and the method of that adjustment that adjustment was comfortable to the city engineer. Um, just to, to a couple of clarifying points about the differences between the the zoning, um, and and the requirements of the zones that are being proposed here as amendments. The R one six zone. This is a single family zone. It would require two covered parking spaces for what he's proposing. Those single family homes, they'd all have to have garages, and then they'd have driveways out front. Uh, Twenty foot setbacks are typical. So you have parking in the garage and in the driveway. And the RM fifteen zone is not a transit oriented development zone. It's not a mixed use zone, so it doesn't get breaks on parking. It's two and a half spaces per unit, the way we require for any multifamily um, multifamily projects. Um, that's what we would require in review with the planning commission for the site plan um, and and the project approvals if it's uh, approved for a zone change. Building heights in the R16 are only 30 feet. Uh, the R18 allows 35 feet of height. Um, the RM15 does allow a 40 foot maximum, but that has to be determined through the process of a conditional use permit with the planning commission. Now, that conditional use permit process allows the commission to look at impacts to neighboring properties and to impose conditions that will mitigate those impacts. So in short, um, we'd be looking for ways to make sure that the height of new buildings that were proposed was not an impact to neighboring properties. And we can, can, we can impose conditions as a city to assure that uh, as long as it's a, reasonable, a reasonably anticipated impact. Um, the uh, public, this is a public comments. We did, uh, we've been talking about this as we go kind of, but just to, to kind of recap, there were a lot of public comments about uh, density. Um, a lot of the comments that we did receive and that we reviewed at the Planning Commission that I'm sure you've seen as well, talk about this high density um, development. This is, this is, these are townhomes. Again, this is nine units to the acre overall. This is a medium density. Uh, this combination of two zones would produce a medium density residential development if it was approved. Um, there were a lot of, of notions or, or comments about skipping different zones, going from agriculture to uh, RM15 being a jump of nine zones or, or whatever. And that's just not how we review zone changes. We review them based on the intent of, of the outcome, uh, of the potentials of the outcome, not on how many zones were skipped to get there. There's not a, you don't have to reach certain levels um, to, to do that. We review it for its impact and its potential support or, or, uh, or non-support from the general plan. Um, 
there were comments about it setting a precedent. I, I, I think we've um, covered that pretty well. These are general plan and zone map amendment requests. There's, there's no precedent to be set here really because they're discretionary acts that you can or you can take or not take as a council. Uh, and we're, we're presenting to you our argument as staff that it's a, good, it's a good change to make based on support from the general plan. The map says one thing, but some objectives and goals and standards of the general plan can be well served by a change like this. And only in this particular situation because it has unique challenges that it faces as a site with environmental concerns and you know, the contamination and um, the, the demolition that needs to happen and the regrading, et cetera. And it also, and it says cell tower, thank you. I always forget the cell tower. It's kind of the orphan child of the problems of this property. Um, but it, it also has these natural, naturally occurring buffers that you don't see on, on many properties. Not many properties are buffered by 340 feet on one side and 70 feet on, as a minimum on, by power quarters. That's not going to happen. There's, there's no precedent uh, set here. There's no danger of that in, in my mind as a, as a staff person. And then um, that, again, speaks to the buffering and setbacks that we just talked about. Um, I, I believe Mr. Brodsky has a, 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 a slide he's going to show you, that, an exhibit, thank you, that, that would show that, that would give you an idea of what the height might look like in the, in the development process. Um, and then again, contamination is, is, as Melinda talked about already, the voluntary cleanup program has already been approved, and he knows how to do that, and it would be overseen by the DEQ. So. Um, there'd be, there'd be people looking at this. It's not, um, it's not going to be uncontrolled. Um, there were also concerns about impact to schools. We talked in the committee, the whole meeting a, a little bit about this. We did sit down with representatives from the school district. Um, they were comfortable with, with this kind of change. Um, PUD subdivisions always require a letter from them. I believe Mr. Brodsky has already obtained that letter on hoping that he gets the zone change from them, but they're not, they're not concerned from the school district about this. Uh, the potential impacts from this change, not that there won't be any impacts, but they feel like they can absorb them and handle them. Uh, public utilities we already addressed um, at some length that will be addressed again by all of those entities if um, zone changes are approved and a subdivision goes forward. And then impact to property values. I, I know a lot of folks worry about the impact of their property values. Um, that Kempsey Gardner Policy Institute found very decisively that even multifamily developments between 2010 and 2018 did not have adverse impacts on the value of single family homes in this county. In fact, quite the opposite, the closer you get to them, new development always brings property value to your homes, uh, regardless of whether it's multifamily or single family. That's at least been the data that's borne out by, by the property taxes. Um, with that said, the Planning Commission did hold that second public hearing that we talked about for these new applications on May 6th. We did get 145 public notices out to, um, to everyone within a 500 foot radius of the subject property. On the second round, we did get 47 public comments. Uh, we got more than that in the first round. Again, um, this, was, this was a second set of applications. The Planning Commission did vote uh, to forward a recommendation of approval uh, four to three uh, on May 6th to the City Council. Those are the findings that they made in making that determination. Uh, we've reviewed those um, at some length, talking about the general plan and the zone change, uh, the zone map amendments tonight. And we are recommending that the city council follow that recommendation from the planning commission and approve the general plan amendment to the future land use map and the zone map amendment for those two properties, the two different zones. Any questions for our staff? I just, I have a comment about sure. the general plan uh -huh. and uh, concerns about amending it. And I take it very seriously. We all do. I mean, it's just not a document that, that we think, okay, well, you know, that's good, but let's do this. That doesn't happen. Right. I mean, we take this very, very seriously. Um, and it's, it's important. Um, anyway, also, uh, the infrastructure, um, the general plan addresses that obviously, but also sometimes we have to rely on our staff. And when we ask, and we've asked and asked, you know, how is this going to impact? What's, you know, what, what is going to happen? Can we handle it? And, you know, we have an incredible staff. And I think it's important that we trust that. And so, anyway, that's... Thank you, appreciate that. I just wanted to address those, those two issues that are very, very concerning and you know we've kind of beat it into the ground i guess but it's that important it is so. absolutely well i agree with diane that 
it's seldom that we change that. But that's why I asked that at the very beginning because, like I said, I've been on 10 years and I know that that, that has happened. And, uh, you know, it's a it's tough. It is absolutely tough. And, uh, and uh, but certain things change, you know, over four or five years and, and we'll probably be getting ready to do a new general plan. We're getting close. Yeah. 20, 2017 was four years ago now, three, yeah. three and a half years ago now. We're, we're getting there. Yeah. Thank you. And at that time, we didn't understand the need for housing that we have, that that cat keeps springing up. That is that is really important as well. So It hadn't quite reached the fever pitch of crisis level yet. It was getting there. But. Yeah, it's on its way. Any other questions? All right, is the applicant uh, available? I sure am. I'm right here. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Brodsky. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen of the City Council. I appreciate your time this evening. My name is Michael Brodsky. I am the owner of Hamlet Development. Uh, our company is very familiar to Mary. Uh, we've been developing neighborhoods in northern Utah since 1994. And over the last 27 years, many of these neighborhoods have been in Mary. Since 2000, our corporate headquarters have been located in Mary. First at 308 East, 45th South, and now across the street from uh, your new city hall complex at 84 West, 4800 South. With your permission, I'd like to walk you through a bit of the history of this property and the application process we've gone through to get us here today. Um, back in the late 1800s, the property was used as a smelting operation. And as a result, there are significant deposits of mine tailings and lead and arsenic heavily contaminating this property. There's an existing 25,000 square foot building and an array of satellite dishes, which were used by the Albertson Company for many years as a communications facility for their operations across the United States. The building has been abandoned for several years and today is a non-conforming use. Over the last few years, a number of developers, even your own city, contracted to purchase the property. Uh, discovering the challenges associated with it all backed out of their contracts. January of this year, my company put the property under contract, fully aware of the environmental issues that plague this property. Later in my presentation, I'll discuss the steps we've taken and will take in order to safely clean up the property to residential standards. When I had it first under contract, we immediately applied to the Planning Commission for a February 1st, 2021 meeting. Uh, we requested a rezone at that time to an RM15 zone for the property as well as a general plan amendment. When we posted the meeting notice on the property, there was such a significant outcry of complaint from neighbors I withdrew my uh, application. And with the help of city staff, I was able to conduct a Zoom meeting with approximately 135 of the neighbors in attendance for the purpose of providing them information of what we were proposing. At that time, our concept plan was for 90 townhouses on the property, including a two acre public park. Uh, but based on the input we received from the neighbors at that meeting, we redesigned our plan, reducing the density to a combination of 20 single family lots facing uh, Bullion Street and 55 townhouse lots in the middle and back of the property. The single family detached homes front Bullion and where they face existing single family detached homes across the street. The townhomes, as I mentioned, are in the center of the uh, property <clears throat> where they back to the Walden Ridge subdivision. We've designed it so that only the end of the townhouses face the rear of the Walden uh, homes. There are a total of eight townhouses proposed that face six homes in Walden Ridge. Uh, let me show you a exhibit of the distance uh, between our proposed townhouses and uh, can I share the screen? Can you see that now? 
No, not yet. Can you see that? Not yet. Uh, how about now? There you go. Yes. Okay. So uh, <clears throat> we're showing two sections through our development. Uh, and this is a profile. We did a uh, extensive grading study. Um, it looks like these buildings will be higher, but on this particular site, there is much as three to five feet of fill that we will be regrading and removing back down to natural grade. This shows uh, the, the profile at the top of the site where there is 107 feet from the end of our townhouses to the existing Walden single family home. The finished grade is approximately five feet or more below the first floor grade of the Walden houses. On the other end of the site, that separation is 92 feet. And again, <clears throat> it is only the end of the townhouse that faced Walden. We've taken an additional step in the design of the houses. Um, and that is where the end faces these adjacent homes. On the top floor, the windows are um, at five, eight feet off the ground. There are transom windows that let in light, but provide privacy both to the townhouse owner and to the adjacent single family home. Um, let me figure out how to get rid of what I've got up on the screen. Okay. Um, bear with me a second while I try and find my cursor here. Okay. Um, while the RM15 zone permits heights up to 40 feet, the townhouses that we're proposing to build have a maximum height of 35 feet. And during the PUD process, we will be requesting that the city uh, limit the townhouse height to the 35 feet. You'll see with that um, height study I just showed you, that means the height of those buildings will be no more than 30 feet uh, where they are adjacent to uh, another uh, community. After that meeting with the neighbors, we resubmitted an application to be on an April 1st planning commission meeting. At that meeting, what we proposed was presented to the planning commission by both staff and myself. At the end of the presentation, again, based on input from neighbors, I requested that our application be withdrawn. From the public comments we received, it became apparent there was a significant concern that the RM15 zone to be approved uh, <clears throat> could uh, permit much higher density than what I was asking for. Uh, in order to avoid that, to assure the public that no more than 75 homes could be built, I resubmitted my application. This time, I identified a portion of the property that would be zoned R16 and the balance of the property that would be zoned RM6, uh, RM15. The combination of these two zones would permit no more than a maximum of the 75 units that I've proposed, thus responding to a significant neighborhood concern. In tandem with the application for rezone and a general plan amendment, we also submitted an application for a boundary adjustment to permit the parcels to receive the requested zoning. The boundary line adjustment is a staff review and the event this application is approved by this council, then the boundary line adjustment will also be uh, moved forward. I wanna tell you that prior to entering into a contract to purchase the property, we were provided a phase one environmental assessment that was prepared by the property owner. The information provided to us indicated there was a high likelihood that the insulation in the walls of the building contained vermiculite heavily impregnated with asbestos and that major portions of the property were contaminated with lead and arsenic and mine tailings from a smelter operation 
that dated back into the late 1800s. I want to respond to a specific comment that was made uh, just this evening by uh, a city councilman. Um, the contamin one of the studies that we've done uh, very recently was to understand what the material is that's contaminating the site. We've determined that is primarily lead and arsenic uh, contained in the mine tailings. <clears throat> we also studied the soil beneath uh, these mine tailings. And when you go underneath the mine tailings and test the soil, there is no contamination beneath them, which demonstrates that nothing has leached out from this contamination. Point being that it is not a soluble material. It does not leach into uh, the water table or the surrounding areas. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I want to go back to this for a moment. The discussion points that I'm intending to cover this evening are uh, in some depth, the environmental issues surrounding the property <clears throat> demonstrate to you a concept plan of how we would like to develop the property, including a discussion of density, on-site parking, buyer profiles of the homeowners who have purchased from Hamlet Homes in five neighborhoods over the last four years. Hmm. Excuse me. This will include a discussion of their age, income, education, and the number of children. And lastly, a brief conversation about traffic impacts. Um, as I told you before, we're now under contract to purchase the property. Prior to entering into that contract, we met with representatives of Murray City staff to discuss how we could afford to clean up the site and build a community that would also provide community benefits. We suggested that we would enter into a voluntary cleanup program with the Department of Environmental Quality to clean up the property. As you've been told this evening, uh, Hamlet Development has some unique experience. This will be the fifth time that uh, we have done a uh, voluntary cleanup on property in Mary City. Um, I have been asked by Habitat for Humanity to also act as a consultant for them on another site that they are buying in Murray City that needs some cleanup. Uh, so we have some very, very unique experience. Um, in a recent conversation with uh, the head of DEQ, uh, he pointed out that we are the most experienced developer in northern Utah and that we've done more cleanups with their department than any other single developer. So when I talk to you about this process, it's based on some pretty significant experience. Um, our plan originally showed a two acre park and 90 townhouses based on that feedback from the neighbors, which was a little surprising because they objected pretty strenuously to a large park. And so we redesigned it, reduced the density. We now have a neighborhood park. And let me show you. Um, this is a rendering of um, what the property, what we're proposing to do. Um, is that visible to you now? Yes. Okay, thank you. So um, the single family lots, as mentioned, will face Bullion Street. The townhouses are tucked in the back of the property. Um, we are providing uh, close to an acre of um, open space around the cell tower that will become a neighborhood park for the use of the residents uh, in this community. There's additional pocket parks of open space scattered throughout. The neighborhood park would include amenities such as a covered pavilion, picnic tables, barbecue, and playground equipment. The park would be operated by the homeowners association and val available for the residents of this uh, neighborhood. Among the objections or concerns that we heard from neighbors was speeding along Bullion. Um, it was mentioned earlier that we have done a traffic study, house engineering, is uh, 
a traffic engineer that has done a lot of work for many of the cities along uh, the Wasatch Front. One of the reasons that I have chosen them to do these traffic studies is because of their close relationship to the cities. Um, they are very conservative in their analysis. <clears throat> we also asked them in tandem with the traffic study to do a traffic calming um, recommendation to us. Um, the traffic calming recommendation uh, suggests that we put up more of the uh, automated traffic signs that tell you, how you what your speed is. They suggest that we restripe um, the street and bring in the traffic uh, lane tighter. Uh, both of those have a good tendency to slow tra uh, uh, traffic down as it comes by. Um, the traffic calming methods that we suggested were presented to Trey Stokes, the city engineer, to make sure that it was something that the city would accept. We, if we are approved again, that's something that we will implement along with uh, the development of this neighborhood. Um, I talked to you a little bit about the uh, contamination on the property. Um, I'd like to talk to you about what the what DEQ does and what the voluntary uh, cleanup program entails. This is a state sponsored program. Um, we hire Hamlet Development has hired Wasatch Environmental, <clears throat> a local environmental consulting firm to do further investigations of the impacts. We're well into that investigation now, and for the last six uh, weeks, um, Wasatch has been on site uh, conducting testing on a very tight grid to understand uh, exactly where this material is, uh, how deep it is, and how extensive. We have submitted an application to DEQ uh, to be uh, submitted into their program, and they have accepted us. Uh, we have started working with representatives of DEQ to create the cleanup plan of the site. Um, the process means that we hire an environmental concerning, a consulting firm to design the uh, cleanup and submit that to DEQ for their review, comments, and it goes to public hearing. Uh, the consulting firm conducts invasive testing of the building and soils to determine corrective actions needed. I mentioned to you earlier that there was a, a concern that the vermiculite insulating the block walls in this building contained asbestos. Within days of having this under contract, I had a consultant on site drilling holes into the building to test the vermiculite. It was with considerable relief that we found out that the vermiculite does not contain asbestos. That could have killed this that cleanup cost by itself would have been well over a million dollars. Uh, all findings and recommendations for the cleanup are then submitted to DEQ for review and approval of our plan. Our environmental consultants supervise the actual cleanup um, uh, work as it is being done, ongoing testings of material being removed, and the contaminated material, in this case, lead and arsenic, are buried on site in a repository. That repository is lined uh, <clears throat> as it is filled up. Once it is filled up, it is then capped with uh, a clay layer, um, markers, uh, bright orange markers to uh, let somebody know that if they are inadvertently digging into it, that it is, um, it is a repository. Uh, it's further capped, depending on whether it is in a parking lot or in the park, uh, beyond the clay and the liner, it is then capped with topsoil and sod or asphalt. Um, <clears throat> during this cleanup period, we have a representative DEQ of DEQ on site Another aspect of the cleanup is uh, dust control. There are monitors around the entire perimeter of the site. Um, 
to identify that none of the dust from the site as we are cleaning it up uh, go off site. Uh, at the same time, we have water trucks on site 24 seven as we are doing our excavation and grading operation to maintain close dust control. And that again is part of the plan that we submit to uh, DEQ. Um, once the cleanup is completed, <clears throat> DEQ provides a certification that the site has been clean to residential safety standards. Pardon me. They, the, the certification and the uh, no further action letter that we get from DEQ provides an indemnification uh, to the developer from any further uh, liability, which is a major reason, by the way, in itself that we would subject ourselves to the DEQ uh, process uh, during the cleanup. Um, hmm. The history of the city of Mary, and, and, and you know this very well, it is that there are a number of areas that have been contaminated um, from the industries that were here for many, many years. Uh, when the smokestacks uh, were taken down to build uh, the hospital, for example, uh, that site was actually, to my knowledge, a Superfund site, much more seriously contaminated than this. The plume, the dust plumes that came out of those smokestacks um, surface contaminated many of the areas around the city. One of the benefits of the VCP is that when we are done, you know that the site has been tested extensively and is safer than most of the surrounding areas that haven't been tested. Um, I wanna talk about just some other uh, facts surrounding what we're proposing to do, and then I, I'll, I'll open this up to um, uh, your questions and of course, public comment. Uh, as mentioned by staff, a unique aspect of this property is that it is separated from the adjacent developments to the east by the Mary City Power Station. And I think I mentioned before that Mary City put this under contract to expand the power station at one point, and they backed away uh, because of the issues. To the north is Bullion Street, to the west is the Rocky Mountain Power Corridor, and to the south adjacent to the Walder Ridge subdivision is a Rocky Mountain Corridor as well. Uh, we're proposing to fence the south property line with six foot high white vinyl fence. Any additional fencing that the city thinks is appropriate as we go through this entitlement process, we of course will provide. I wanna point out that these homes are not apartments. There was a concern that the, uh, this was high density residential apartment property. It's not. They are fee simple townhouses and single family detached homes. That means that each home, including the townhouse, is individually owned. Um, while affordability is a major issue in our area today, and I'm not telling you that these townhouses are entry-level homes, I expect the average purchase price to be in the high threes for the townhouses and into the upper fives for the single-family homes. They still provide an opportunity for the children who grew up in this area to stay here uh, for empty nesters to move into these townhouses and also stay in the area. Um, as was mentioned earlier, the parking uh, for the single family homes are designed. Each one will have at least a two car garage uh, with two car parking in the driveway. Some of them may have three car garages. We haven't finalized uh, the design of the single family homes yet. Uh, the townhouses are also designed with two car garages. And in addition, there'll be at least a half a space of guest parking scattered through the neighborhood. These parking, uh, the proposed parking that we're putting in here meets or exceeds city requirements. And as typical of parking, we've designed in similar communities uh, in other areas of merit. Buyer demographics. I'd like to talk a little bit about the buyer demographic of who buys these houses. Um, 
The attached housing does not mean it needs to be close to transit. This is just another form of, uh, uh, of available housing. Over the last 25 years, Hamlet Homes has built hundreds of similar homes in and around Murray. <clears throat> the statistics I'm about to quote are from townhome sales in five neighborhoods that Hamlet Homes has built in just the last four years. One in Draper, three in Murray, and one in Taylorsville. The average age of uh, the townhouse buyers between 40% of them are between 25 and 34 years old. 25% are between 35 and 44 years old. And what I think will surprise you most is that 34% are between 45 and over 55 years old. The average income of these buyers, 34%, are between 55 and $95,000 a year. 62% of them are between $96,000 and $155,000 a year. Again, keep in mind, I'm talking about townhouse buyers. Education, these are very highly educated people. 66% are college grads. 18% have advanced degrees. Children, your concern about the schools being overcrowded is unfounded. We have had discussions with the local school district. Uh, and even today, they don't consider themselves to have a crowded issue, crowding issue. But the interesting thing about this is that the townhouse buyer has significantly fewer children than the single family buyer has. For this to be built out, if it was economically feasible as all single family homes, you'd have more children in this neighborhood than the combination of single family and townhouses that we're proposing. 67% of the townhouse buyers um, that we have, our Hamlet homes have sold to, have no children at all. By contrast, during that same period of time, the single family homes that Hamlet sold averaged 1.22 children per household, which is two and a half times the number of children in a townhouse community. I wanna mention one more thing about density. Uh, earlier, staff showed you pictures of the Ballantour development um, uh, I developed that um, uh, with Hamlet a few years ago. The density of that neighborhood was 12 units to an acre. The density of this neighborhood is nine units to an acre. So um, the density that we're building here is still significantly less than what you just saw in that other community. Um, I think we've talked enough about traffic um, and with that, I will conclude my presentation and open this up to any questions that you might have from me, please. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> I know, it's surprising, but oh my goodness, that was quite the informative discussion. I don't. Brett? Just that you fed us a lot of information. My goodness, I've sat through a lot of, of these and, and that was a lot of information. And uh, so thank you for, uh, and, and for your information about how long you've been here and, and your success here in Murray. But we've never met, but I've, I mean, I've seen you here, but it seemed like a, a great developer, someone who uh, has developed a lot here in Murray. So thanks for your information, Mr. Rotsky. Mary has been an extraordinary opportunity for me over the years. And I've said this numerous times, I've been a builder for 50 years. And my experience in Mary is one of the greatest that I've ever had in my career. I don't have any questions at this time. Can we have more discussion after public comment? Yes. Okay, thank you, Mr. Brodsky. Uh, I will now open it up to public comment. We have uh, any letters that we see before Friday, June 11th, we've already been forwarded to the council and we've read them. So we've reviewed those. So any public comment will be anything after uh, June the 11th. Do we have any? Yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> um, the first one was one that was submitted. I'm gonna have Patty read this one first. 
Okay. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. This is from Dan Fazzini. He lives in District 2 and is in view of the project. And Patty, can you speak up just a little bit? Sorry. Sure. Um, okay. Is that any better? Is that better? Yeah. Yes, just speak loud. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so uh, this is Dan Fazzini. He lives in District 2 in view of the project, and he is a past Taylorsville City Planning Commissioner. In my five years on the Taylorsville Planning Commission, we very rarely saw this level of opposition to any application. When there were significant comments, we highly scrutinized the application. Having more than five residents oppose a project was highly unusual, much less 100 or more. The RM15 requires a 25 foot setback for both the front and the rear. The applicant needs to share the setback between buildings to what appears to be barely 25 feet. And he references city code on that. And the driveway provides no yard setback with their current proposed plan to make this work. If the city is truly interested in addressing low medium income housing, they would not have put a moratorium on mixed use just one month ago, a few months ago. This bill is moderate income housing, not sure this would qualify. In the general plan, the context is the city as a whole, not every acre across the city. Strategy number three in the general plan talks about compatible types of housing. I would argue this project is not. The city actually owns open space, which could be used for that purpose, including 150 acres just south of this project, namely the golf course. Government should not be in the business of competing with private businesses to begin with. Make no mistake, this will be a significant increase for Walden residents, mostly along Hollow Spring, since that is the easiest access to the entire valley outside of a short distance into Midville. This means that Hollow Spring may see more than its share than 20% increase. Although the infrastructure may be designed for it, still a significant change over the status quo. The site is not a well-served development for transit or active transportation. The nearest regular bus stop on 700 West is nearly a mile away. I ask that this application, if moved forward, it is done at a maximum of R16, which represents as small or incremental change, not a large five to nine zone jump with a couple of two hour meetings. The submitted plan will directly impact our egress and will likely be able to see the units, even though I was just outside of the 500 foot notification. And that's the end of that one. Thank you. We have a couple of people online that want to make comments. Um, first will be John Christensen, and he's speaking for a group. So, John, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. You'll have five minutes. I'm sorry, Joe. Hi, Council. I want to thank you for your time. I have emailed most of you today, and I am representing Stop 935 Bullion Group, which encompasses more than 220 citizens and our residents. I've asked you for a motion to extend the time we have to share. You've now given, Dan, um, I'm sorry, Jared and Mr. Broads more than 90 minutes, and you've given the citizens who live in this area no time to respond. But let's talk about the, the issues at hand to begin with. First of all, and Jared started off tonight being very clear about one point. And this is a point that is salient and you need to be aware of it and keep it front of mind. This is the most opposed project that's ever come to city planning. It's now taken multiple submissions to the city just to try to resolve a few of the objections. But as a whole, the community still opposed it. In fact, before the first planning commission meeting, our group actually went out and did surveys in the area and we found a higher than 90 percent opposition to this project so it's not just a majority there's a super majority of opposition to what mr brodsky is presenting to the city um about the 935 project it encompasses a huge number of uh individuals who live in this area uh, individuals who volunteer hundreds and hundreds of hours to our community to make it a better place 
we're all united about this specific cause or this cause. We oppose the current petition by Mr. Brodsky to move the density to arm 15. During Mr. Brodsky's first conversation with the community, we made it very clear that we weren't interested in a density or a zoning that would allow up to 40 feet townhouses. And that has not changed despite any of the changes or any of the any of the suggestions or comments or proposals that have been made. We're also very disappointed that the council um, isn't giving us time to express or provide answers to some of the, the concerns that exist. For example, and I'm gonna try and touch on a few of them, but I am gonna be limited based on the limited amount of time you're giving us. One of the first um, uh, comments during the discussion two weeks ago about this project council had down was our opposition to the park and our concern diane i know you were very confused by anyone who'd be opposed to a park our concern was and anyone who's gone to 935 the entrance off of bullion you can see that the property drops 40 feet so mr brodsky's proposal was going to leave a park with a slope of 30 to 40 degree elevation that's not a park that's a green space. It wasn't providing anything to the community. So we had concerns around that. We tried to resolve those by taking an alternate proposal to Mr. Brodsky, one which actually uh, asked him to put pickleball courts on the park. And Mr. Brodsky simply ignored an RM10 proposal um, that the community might have been able to get behind. I think in large part because there's still so much uncertainty about what can actually be done with this project. But Mr. Brodsky, anything he's bringing to the city council today, anything he's promising, he's not able to stand by or, or guarantee. Um, a couple other things that have been discussed. We've discussed traffic. The, the biggest challenges that exist with all the traffic studies that have been done is Mr. Brodsky hired a firm on a sleepy Thursday afternoon in the middle of March. It didn't address Hollow Springs. It was only one day. It was done at a time where we have more than 25% of the current kids in the schools who are not attending right now. And it was also done at a time where many of the professionals who live in both Ivory, the new Goffs communities, and the neighborhood as a whole were not out traveling. They had to smooth it to make the traffic look okay. And it really didn't address the peak hours. So even if we take and try and project past studies that the city's done, it doesn't take into account other projects that have been developed since uh, those initial ones were done and, and prior to the pandemic, such as Ivory or Goth. And, and we could continue on with, with our concerns about many, many other uh, issues that have been presented um, by both Jared and Mr. Brodsky in response to our, our, our concerns. Uh, one of which, uh, several of Mr. Brodsky's projects have been brought up between Granton Square, um, between Valentour on 5600 West. The one thing that, that needs to be clear about all these projects is these projects, this isn't an apples to apples comparison. These are projects that go to major uh, they have egresses to major arteries. Even the Valentour, which Jared brought up and spoke highly about, uh, the closest residential neighborhood that's next to it is, is a bunch of duplexes, which there's nothing wrong with duplexes, but there's nothing similar to that in this area. Really, because of the limited amount of time that you're giving us, there's, there's four concerns that we really want to be heard. First, our voice has been ignored. Once again, even tonight, you've given Jared, you've given Mr. Brodsky more than 90 minutes to chat. We've been given hardly any time to express our concerns. Two facts are being misrepresented and fear tactics are being used to push through this project. Um, this is Joe, your time is up, so wind it up if you would. I will. Of the tail wagging the dog. Three, and this is a salient point, the general and master plan for more than five decades has been done on a reoccurring basis and repeatedly for those five decades. This area from 700 west to 13th, from 5400 to I-15 has been designated as an R1A with ag, parks, and open space. And this absolutely ignores the general plan. I know Jared says that Section 8 of the general plan allows for these approvals, but that's not how the general plan was written. It wasn't allow, written to allow for a 10-point jump in the designation of the zoning request. And then the fourth concern we have more than anything is this sets an incredible 
precedence that that's that's not reasonable for the city from representation not being heard to a huge zone change that ignores the master plan uh yeah, there's just concerns that, that that really really exist for the precedence this sets not only for mr brodsky but but future developers that might come into the the city so again there's hundreds and hundreds of residents that absolutely oppose this project for numerous reasons. Jared started off tonight saying this is the most opposed project they've seen in planning and zoning. And then he spent 60 minutes trying to answer all of our concerns without giving us a voice to say it. We're, we're as Dan said uh, in a previous comment, we're not opposed to high density or medium density in the right places, but if the city council entertains any changes tonight, we ask that they don't allow a significant zone change. Please do not allow anything beyond R16. If Mr. Brodsky can make that work with his plan and the, the 38 to 40 homes that he can put in there, then great. If not, it's time for Albertsons to realize that the value of this land is not what he's he's selling to that. Okay, thank you, thank you Joe. Next, we have Lindsay Ross. Lindsay, you can go ahead and unmute. You'll have three minutes for your comment. I have any additional comments? Thank you. Okay, and then Patty will, um, we recorded the other comments we received online, so Patty will play that right now. The first thing we received was a petition from Doug Barnett signed by residents opposing the proposed zone change. This petition was forwarded to members of the city council. The next comment we received was from Brent Ludlow. I live in the general area two blocks from where this rezoning is trying to take place. I've been here for over 35 years and I'm opposed to changing the zone in this area to more than what it has been previously. I wanted to stay single family residents. I've heard in some of these meetings people talking about fixing the problem with the tailings in the area, but what they're doing is just moving a little ways and capping it again. That's doing nothing to get rid of the problem of the tailings being there. I think it's time that the city council should start listening to the people they're supposed to be representing. Brent Ludlow. Brent Ludlow. Apologize. The next comment is from Dan and Shannon Mitchling. Still adamantly opposed to the zoning change on bullion request by Hamlet Homes. The next comment is from Sarah Buck. To whom it may concern, I am a new resident to Murray City who moved in last June. My husband and I spent over two years searching for the correct house and neighborhood that would fulfill our needs and desires. We were thrilled when we finally found our home. We have researched to find out, we have researched the master plan of our neighborhoods to make sure that the area we brought would fulfill our needs long term. By changing the zoning within my neighborhood, you are changing the main reason we chose this area and the amount of traffic my children will be exposed to as they travel to and from school. The schools being affect the schools being affected being able to fulfill the needs of my children and the community. To put anything in the proposed area except for single family residents, it's a huge betrayal of every citizen who moved into this area having done their research and having made their decision based upon what the city had in their master plan. I understand there is a need for housing, but there are better alternatives. There is another development on 5300 South and 7th West that is already adding more options and impacting our community and schools, but in, the way, but in a way it makes sense based upon location. Thank you for your consideration and I hope the council will put the needs of the current citizen with whom you have elected to serve and represent before the potential of other citizens who do not currently live in Murray City or with whom you have obligations to. The next comment is from Stacy Garcia. I live at 940 Chester Burt Cove. I see hawks, birds, geese, quills, and occasionally the fox that lives in an easement behind my back fence. Hamlet Development wants to build three-story townhouses right up to the line of the easement behind my back fence. Why? Development is inevitable. Why can't we build single-family homes or twin homes on that land? Why can't we put the house on the west end of the property facing the field and extra parking behind Chesterbrook? That would eliminate house, houses right behind Chesterbrook and have some space between us. I'm also worried 
when they start digging, running new water and sewer lines through the soil that's tested positive for lead and arsenic. There's a risk there. You already okayed townhomes to go in a few blocks up and around the corner on approximately 5300 South and 700 West, which they can only turn right out of so there will be an impact on our traffic numbers. This development is not affordable housing like you were trying to spin it. It's luxury housing, call it what it is. There are other locations closer to bus and tracks routes more suitable for this kind of development with more room. You are already starting a huge townhome development off State Street at about 4800 South, which will include a store and restaurants. Why do we need them in our neighborhood then? Please keep it lower density zoning for the to single family or twin homes. Thank you, Stacy Garcia. The next comment is from Clark Bullion. Hello, I am Clark Bullion, Murray Citizen for District 3 and candidate for mayor. I am not opposed to projects of this nature in general as they may potentially enhance the neighborhood and provide appropriate housing opportunities for our community. I am opposed to making exceptions to the master plan that will set a precedent for other exceptions, which undermines the master plan as a whole. If changes need to be made to the zoning, then it should be done through a thoughtful and thorough review of the master plan as an official revision that takes a long time, the long term needs of Murray citizens into consideration and balances the changes with compensatory changes elsewhere in Murray. Best Clark Bullion. Okay, for Bullion Street, the first thing we That was all the comments we received. Okay, thank you. All right, I'll close the public hearing then and bring it back to the council. Any comments, any questions? Go ahead, Kat. Okay, so I wanna speak to a couple of things that we heard tonight. Um, First off, the tra traffic concerns. Um, I, I shared a lot of the concerns initially that I heard from public comments. And uh, I mean, my kiddos go to Viewmont. We go up and down that road at the peak times of the day. And not only, you know, if, if I make a, if I vote on something that could impact traffic and it goes poorly, like, and I have to deal with it, that's one thing. But if it went poorly, I'd have to deal with my husband who picks up our kids and my mother-in-law um, who is amazing to pick up our kids. And so I just want to say, I take this so seriously, this traffic issue. And I asked a lot, a lot of questions between the workshop and, and tonight about what that traffic study looked like, what traffic studies do. I learned more than I ever thought I would about traffic and, and what that means and long-term impacts and, Traffic's never going to be amazing at peak times on that street. It, it's not going to be. Um, and that doesn't mean we shouldn't try to improve it and use the tools we have to, to improve that street. But I have, I've been convinced that this development, this zone change um, proposal is appropriate within what we know about traffic, what we know about this street at different times of the day and not just during the pandemic. Um, in addition to that, um, mixed zone development, mixing townhouses and single family is a really great tool when it comes to equitable housing. Um, I, this is not affordable housing and I don't wanna pretend I think it is. I wish that um, Melinda and Jared were here today proposing apartments that were all gonna be affordable housing and I would vote for it so fast and make so many people so angry. But I wish that's what was being proposed right now. It's not, um, but the most direct way to reduce housing costs is to increase density by building more homes on less land, and this includes townhouses. And that's supply and demand. It's not just, we have an affordable housing crisis, we also have a housing supply crisis where there just isn't that supply. Um, with that, um, I've, we've gotten a few comments tonight. I just wanna say that every single email that was sent to us, I read, I spent hours on the phone the last few weeks with different people with different opinions and different concerns. I think I had one voicemail I missed because of meetings today and that, to that person, I apologize. Um, but every other one, just know that we take them to heart, we read them and take it really seriously. The biggest question is, would you want this in your neighborhood? And I have a two part answer to that. First, yes, but it's also is my neighborhood. Um, 
we walk past council member Cox's house regularly walking up that street. His house, I think, is pictured in half of those plans. Um, it is our neighborhood. So, so please know the ownership that we take there. Um, my kids are going to walk up those sidewalks. I'm going to drop them off at school. Um, I'm going to really hope I'm right about this traffic thing and trusting the experts and that my husband's not going to kill me when he tries to pick them up and it's awful. Um, and just that I really do believe this is the best use for this land. I truly believe that. I'm really grateful that we have someone who's going to be cleaning it up, making it safer. And I think it's thoughtful. I think Brodsky has been incredibly thoughtful and collaborative. I've heard a lot of this is the most opposed project. I think it's one of the most collaborative projects I've ever seen. And that doesn't mean everyone's happy but it has been exceptionally collaborative, which has been really neat to see. Um, so I, I commend Brodsky for that. Um, so that's my thoughts um, on where I'm at. Thank you, Kat. Anybody else? Yeah, I just, uh, we're, we're here to consider a, the changing of the um, general plan. And I, I support changing that. I, I just absolutely have not done that very often. But uh, with this, and uh, as Pat said, best use for this land, I mean, for goodness sakes, I, I'm just listening to how it's contaminated. And, and uh, I, I'd, I don't know, I'd be maybe concerned. I don't know if the winds blow over at your place, David, or uh, Dale, but uh, I think this is an opportunity to get this cleaned up. And uh, as one of the uh, um, uh, citizen comments, public comments uh, said uh, that they're not opposed to the townhomes. Uh, I agree with that. Uh, not probably go as far as Pat, uh, Kat says about apartments, but uh, but townhomes and, and single family. <laughs> yeah, Dale says thank you. Anyway, yeah, we've dealt that. I mean, we, we have an area up in our area that they had talked about apartments and they're thrilled that they got twin homes. So, anyway, all right. Yes, I've had I've asked so many questions, and um, they've they've been answered, and I really appreciate that. Um, and as far as this council not listening to the community, believe me, we listen, and all of us here have researched, gone, walked it. I mean, I certainly have, and I'm sure everybody else has uh, ruminated over it. Um, you know, certainly read every one of the comments, every one of the letters, and we really do care. Um, so, anyway, I just don't have any more questions. I think I've asked them all. So. Okay, thank you. I'm going to take a couple of minutes. Uh, this process has been going on a long time, uh, longer than most. And that's because of the public input and the developer's willingness to do what, what he could to uh, listen to the public. But I, I'll be honest with you, I've never seen such a mean-spirited debate about a project in my life. Uh, what people said about me, it really doesn't matter because I must have first have respect for your opinion before or for you before your opinion has an effect on me, and I don't know you, and you don't know me. Well, where I take, where I take uh, offense is when you attack my colleagues on this council, or my colleagues in the planning and zoning, or the hardworking men and women that work for Murray City. Uh, that, that's out of bounds, that really is, and there's been a lot of that through this process. And I, I must say, I'm, I'm disappointed in a lot of people. I do apologize to a lot of residents of Murray because there is so much misinformation about this. Some of it, I think, uh, is, is purposeful just to keep it stirred up. There was a flyer that went door to door. Everybody in the neighborhood got one that said there would be 150 plus homes that it would go through the power lines all the way to uh, lower bullion, change to 120 homes, even after several discussions. 
I do apologize that that went on. Uh, that was never the intent of the developer, and it would never pass the code. Or would we allow that to happen? Uh, there were a couple of ex-council members that that uh, weighed in on this. One saying that he always listened, tried to listen to his constituents. We all have done that. But it's hard to tell what your constituents really want when there is so much misinformation out there about this project. It's, it's disheartening. Uh, another another ex-councilman talked about the danger of changing the master plan and, and the zoning. And he's right. We could be opened up to a lawsuit if there was another nine-acre parcel that had a, a deserted satellite farm and a ten, fifteen, twenty thousand uh, dollar or thousand square foot building that had contaminated soil that they wanted to put townhomes and uh, and single family houses on, and we didn't allow them to do that. If that ever happened, we could be in trouble. But that won't happen. That piece of property does not exist. And as we demonstrated earlier, these council men and women that have been on this council before us have voted for these very same things. So I'm a little disappointed that they felt they had to weigh in on this. I, I don't know what their, their reasoning is, but whatever it is, it's for them. And, and I know that upset people as well. And, and like I say, I'm just... I'm sorry that people are so upset about this. I uh, I think the last thing I want to make sure everybody knows is there was another letter out there that said we took a $16,000 bribe. It didn't happen. But that's the type of mean-spirited emails, mean-spirited Facebook, Facebook's terrible, uh, things that are out there. We represent, I represent the people in my area, but I also represent 10,000 other people in my district, and so do these people. Most of the people that are opposed to this project don't live in the area. They live anywhere from blocks to miles away. Some are in different states. They, I saw the uh, petition, the aforementioned petition. There's, there's people on there from Nantucket. There's people from St. George. There's people from... Uh, all over the country, and then there's just there's a lot that say they live in Murray, but there's no way to prove that, and there's no comment. It's just, and I don't know what they've been told. Have they been told it's apartments? I had one guy that signed the petition. His wife said, "Well, so and so signed your that petition," and I kind of chuckled and I said, "You did?" And he said, "Yep, I don't want apartments over there. Apartments were never going to be there." But that's the misinformation that's out there that's being spread. So for those of you that are listening that are uh, upset about this, no project is is perfect. Uh, I don't know if if it was all R16 and they could make a pencil out. I think people would be against that too. I think it's just unfortunate, but I think this is the best use of that property. Uh, I had one today that say, how would you feel? If this project was in your backyard, guess what? It's in my front yard. And I'm, I'm not thrilled, but I think it will be a good project. I visualize homes. I visualize uh, new neighbors. One person actually told, well, more than one, but one person actually told me that if this project goes forward, the people in that development would not be welcome in the community. I don't know what that means. Are you not going to let them come to church? Are you going to throw rocks at them when they go to Smith's? I just don't understand this this attitude that that this project is brought up. But we go back to the project, and the project is a good project. Uh, There's been more than one developer look at it. This is the only one that can make it work. And if, if that doesn't happen... I fear the next step is apartments or some other type of high density. So, you know, I, I, I there again, I just, I'm ranting in the, but I've had a lot of time to, <laughs> to think about this because the email or the, the Facebook just keeps on coming. But 
I appreciate the people, even even the ones that are against this, the hard work they put in. I I realize it isn't easy, but man, stick to the facts and and work to better the city, not not destroy it. And same thing for ex council men and women. Look at what you've done in the past and see what's different about this before you put it out there on Facebook and make the residents nervous. Uh, with that, I don't have anything else. Does anybody else have anything? All right, I'll bring it back to the council for a motion. Okay, I'll make a motion to adopt the ordina ordinance relating to land use, which amends the general plan from parks and open space and low density residential to medium density residential and amends the zoning map for A1 to R16 and RM15 for the property located at approximately 935 West Bullion Street, Murray, Utah. I'll second. It's been moved and seconded, Brooke. Ms. Turner? Aye. Mr. Hells? Aye. Ms. Martinez? Aye. Mr. Cox? Aye. Okay, with that, we'll move on to a business item. Consider the ordinance adopting the rate of tax levies for the fiscal year commencing July 1st, 2021 and ending July 30th, 2022. Brenda, you're still here. Thank you. Okay, I'll make this relatively quick. It's one of the longest council members meetings I've been in. So um, before you is a resolution to adopt the um, tax rates for the 2021-2022 uh, budget. Um, as you know, we are not having a truth in taxation hearing this year. So our tax rates have gone down. Murray City, um, unless there is new growth, uh, receives the same amount of property tax year after year. So as house values have risen, the tax rate will go down to compensate for that. That does not mean that an individual homeowner will pay less property taxes or will pay the same property taxes from year to year, depending on how their value of their house goes up in comparison with all the other neighborhoods they could pay more or less. And then of course, there's all the other taxing districts that may or may not raise taxes. So, um, so the tax rates did go from uh, 0.001689 to 0.001608 for the city of Murray. And then for the library, it went down from point, this is a good number, 000 0.000439 to 0.00418. And he did have, um, the auditor did come up with an increase in value um, of 127,673 in growth for Murray City. And if it, it, just to um, put that in perspective, that is less than a 1% COLA for our employees. So property tax does not increase with inflation, um, especially in Murray where we don't have a lot of development from the, the zoning and the changes, we think we have a lot of development, but compared to other cities, we have very little development going on. Um, and then uh, the library did get an additional $33,000 in um, property taxes. So uh, that's what the resolution is before you. All right, any questions for Brenda? No, just thanks as always. Thank you. Yeah, good job. Yes. All right, I'll take a motion. I'll move that uh, we adopt the ordinance for the rate of the tax levies for the fiscal year commencing July 1st, 2021 and ending June 30th, 2022. I'll second. It's been moved and seconded. Brooke? Ms. Turner? Aye. Mr. Hells? Aye. Ms. Martinez? Aye. Mr. Cox? Aye. 
All right, mayor's report. Okay, um, it's been quite a long afternoon. I'm just going to bring up one thing this evening, uh, and that is that uh, over the uh, the past uh, days, you may have uh, heard heard from residents who would like us to uh, ban fireworks. I've had several requests. And uh, as the council knows, and I, just a reminder to the public that uh, the only authority that we have been given by the legislature to ban fireworks uh, are in areas that uh, are uh, that have wildland or wildland interface. Um, and in Murray, that includes uh, Jordan River Parkway, Wheeler Farm and Murray Park. And since they're considered open space, they're allowed uh, to, uh, by state law, we have the authority to ban fireworks, but only in those areas. So uh, as you hear from constituents, as I have, uh, we just need to let them know that. Some won't, won't, don't accept that, but that's the fact. Uh, we, can't, uh, we can't do it. We don't have the authority to do it. And, and trust me, uh, if I could, I'd certainly consider it, but uh, I, I, I can't. Uh, I spoke against the, the fireworks uh, law when it was passed uh, several years ago, but uh, it was nevertheless passed. So that's what we're having to live with. Uh, for the public, uh, you can view firework restriction area uh, map on the front page of our website, as well as the uh, there's a link to the notice from the state fire marshal that specifies the dates that they're legal to discharge. And those dates, uh, in uh, July are the 2nd through the 5th and the 22nd through the 25th are the only dates that they're allowed to be discharged. O outside of that, then they are not legal and we can enforce that. So uh, that's all I was going to uh, bring up tonight. Unless you have questions, I can answer. Any questions for the mayor? Oh, looks like it. <laughs> I just have a question about cool centers. The county is... is um, Operating cool well, they're having cool centers where people can come in and um, get a respite from the heat. And I'm wondering if we are going to have those, or if if we have any that are designated as cool centers. Uh, we haven't uh, discussed cool centers. I have noticed that, that that there are several throughout the county. In fact, quite a few. I think maybe even 50. I think is the number I heard. But uh, we did get a complaint today from some of the senior recreation center that it was too cold in there. <laughs> but, <laughs> That'd be a cool center. <laughs> um, so, so obviously, uh, you know, public those public areas, but we haven't designated any uh, at this point. Okay, just checking. Thank you. Mine was just the same. I had a resident reach out about um, places for the homeless. Um, but other than the library, is the Senior Recreation Center a public space that someone could go into? It is. Okay. And if someone reached out from the county or from one of the nonprofits, would they just contact your office about setting up such a station? That would be, yeah, that's what I would recommend. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. Thank you. With that, the meeting is adjourned.